important civilization in ancient Mexico and in the land of the Mayas, where he was called Quetzalcoatl, the serpent with fiery plumes, because of the Drakar, the Viking ship in which he had come and which appeared to have wings and plumes and all its lights on, turning like a luminous disk, sometimes in the full light of midday. But the most extraordinary thing that Perry Jacques relates in this book, which he hasn't yet written, is that Quetzalcoatl's beloved was called Papin Alouine. That is to say that the Princess Papin of the Aztec legend was not the sister of Moctezuma, who might have also been a Viking, because he swore that he came from Tula, or Thule, but a semi-divine Hyperborean priestess who came to Fetramanaland, Albania, in the disc called Astra, or Wafeln, with Quetzalcoatl. And when Quetzalcoatl went away, no one knows where, to the interior earth or the morning star, Papin became as if dead, but not in Tenochtitlan, but much farther south, in a region near the other pole, in a secret city in the Andes, possibly near the peak of Mount Melimoyu. Because before he went away forever, the man of Ul went southward, even farther southward, and it was Quetzalcoatl who rebuilt the civilization of Tiahuanacu, taking other names. There he was called Tamanduare, Sueca, Contiki Viracocha, Pezume, Manco Capac. Papin was called Nu, and also Mama Okul and Mama Runtu. She was the queen of the south, that is to say, the queen of Sheba, because Sheba means south. She lived in a land of lakes and volcanoes, on an island surrounded by a sea of flames, which was later called Chile, or Chile, which is narrow like a double-edged sword. A psychic spinal column of the planet, a region once inhabited by giants, who will return to populate it when they emerge from their ancient prisons in the mountains, breaking through their walls of rock. Thus, Papin lay, awaiting the return of Quetzalcoatl. She appeared to be dead, but really she was only asleep. She was the sleeping beauty, the one who is still asleep. Centuries passed, and a Spaniard came to these regions, driven by the same secret longing. He was Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, also known in another turn of the wheel as Petrus Tolatanus, who would write the book of magic love entitled Rosarium Philosophorum, in which he would reveal how to bring back to life the woman who appears to be dead, how to awaken the woman who lies sleeping. Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa lost his turn of the wheel, when he had already reached the southernmost sea and could see the ices of the strait that cuts through those regions, where he founded the Ciudad del Rey Felipe, which was really the city of hunger and thirst, the city of the great longing. He was assailed by doubts, and his ship was battered by a huge wave, which forced him to turn back. He was unable to discover the narrow passage that leads to the oasis of the Isis because his heart was torn between opposing memories and conceptions of the world. He was incapable of surrendering himself completely to a Hyperborean dream. He fell just at that point in the secret geography of the world where the fruit of return called Caliphate grows. Poor Petrus! To the end of his days, he would never do anything more than wander in despair, struggling to return to those regions where he believed he had found the white island in the sky, the gates of the city of dawn. He was swallowed up by the sea without leaving a single trace, but his ghost will always return to the place where a wind from another universe blows, and the sun of the southern midnight bathes the frozen plains in its black light protecting the ice flows that move silently towards the oasis where the hill of revelation lies hidden, 
and the thunderous roar made by the huge slabs of ice as they crash into the water sounds like the voice of the gods as they half reveal their secrets to us. Turn after turn of the wheel, always the same, with tiny variations in its meaning or in its laws, but not in its force. Petrus, the stone which fell from a broken crown, will return to those regions to try and awaken the sleeper and bring back to life the one who is not dead, but who is also not alive. But the turnings of the wheel do have an end. They are not infinite for one Petrus alone. I interpret the giants. I stopped reading. Now I knew that Papin and Halloween were one and the same. The condor resumed his flight. A little before reaching this altitude, I had tried to scale a cliff, but I had had to give up my attempt because one side of the mountain fell away vertically. On a plateau stood a rock shaped like a standing man. He looked like a sentry guarding the entrance to a cave, perhaps to a whole subterranean world. A shadow on the rock face might well be this entrance. As I had no means of reaching the spot, I had to resign myself to looking at the petrified guard for a time. The Andes are made of dark brown mineral-rich material. The slopes of the Himalayas, Alps, and Parenses are covered with forests of pine and other types of trees to great heights. Here in the Andes, there is only bare, eroded rock which gives off a powdery mixture of iron, copper, silver, gold, and lead, and a subtle vibration of radium which can imperceptibly influence the mind, producing sporadic states of enlightenment. To my right, the everlastingly snow-covered leaks of La Paloma and El Plomo rise up until they touch the sky. These peaks were the places of pilgrimage and worship of a long-vanished race. From them, the white gods used to communicate with the stars. I stood up and felt suddenly dizzy. I had to steady myself against the rock. As if in a flash of lightning, this world was blotted out and I could only see a black wall and two gigantic shapes outlined in the rock face by broken veins of gold. One of the giants stretched his arms upwards towards the high peaks, the other bowed his head down until he almost touched the foot of the mountain. I cannot say precisely how long the vision lasted, but in that moment it was given to me to relive that vision exactly as it had first appeared to me in my adolescence. I again stared at the giants imprisoned in the Andean rock, trapped in the earth, tortured by two contrary forces, dragged upwards and downwards in a titanic struggle which will only cease when these veins of mineral gold manage to come together, turning into a liquid gold which can be drunk and gives us eternal life. She It is getting late. Seen from the bridge over the river, the twilight which covers one end of the city envelops the coastal cordillera in veils of vermilion, sapphire, and emerald green creating the optical illusion of a land of longing where the red men of the distant horizon live. At the opposite end of the city, the vast cordillera of the Andes reflects this mirage and projects it into the silence of the approaching darkness. I let my heart lead me, walking like a fearless sleepwalker through the streets of the city of Santiago de la Nueva Extremadura, in the depths of whose memory are stored the echoes of the footsteps and the dreams of people long since vanished. My master, Jason, my past comrades, the many people who have searched its hidden corners, the first poets who came here and founded the city. Alcino, the only brother that I recognize here, also dreamed that he could fly in this country. When we approach the central event in our destiny, our mind becomes clouded, and it almost always takes us by surprise. This time, it will not be like that, 
as if my heart were guiding me. In the deathly light of the street lamps, I walked along a street bordered by tall trees, whose branches intertwined, forming a roof which was stirred by the breeze. From the gardens rose the heady scent of jasmine and roses and the aromas of springtime. I stopped. How many times through the years would I have to pass by this house? What will have become of her? Will she still exist? Will she now be another uninhabited blue? When I reached her doorstep, my heart began to beat with a strange rhythm. Since there were no obvious paths, the heart had followed its own. The door opened, and in the shadowy entrance stood the slender figure of a woman wearing a long red gown, which reached down to her feet. The Glance I remember almost nothing about our reunion, only, vaguely, that there was a quadrangular hall and a narrow corridor along which she led me to a room at the back of the house. She lit some candles and invited me to sit in a wicker chair which creaked gently beside a window which was open onto the star-filled sky, a Chilean spring sky. My heart inside your breast caused me to recognize your footsteps. Perhaps you, too, recognized mine as well. This time, we have met again in all lucidity, because I also possess your heart. I sat there for a long time, telling her all that I could remember about my existence since we had parted many ages ago. I told her about the garden of my childhood, the city of Avalon, the tree which almost touched the sky, Jason, my master, the dog in the Antarctic, the oasis of the Isis, Papin, the white gods, our Hyperborean destiny, the memory of our blood. And she was always present in every one of these stories, because I carried her heart inside me. I realized that the cosmic poetry which had taken possession of me was that suprapersonal spark which her heart had brought into my breast. Now I could return it to her. She sat silent. She knew how to listen with the sweetness that always seemed to emanate from her whole being, her hands lying quietly in her lap, sitting beside the window. When I finally stopped talking, as if the ability to string words together had deserted me, she said, Behind the words is a secret dialogue which is also being conducted between us. It is this dialogue that interests me and to which I have been listening. How much you have explained to me through it. Yes, how much. I realize that I have told her that the face that I saw appear in the flower was hers. She looked at me as if I was the window and she could see the starry firmament through me. If I should ever have to journey through the constellations and were to meet beings with eyes like those of the people on earth, I should certainly never find anyone with this particular way of looking at one. Her heavenly eyes suddenly seemed to go out behind long, golden lashes. They disappeared as if into a fairway, interior world, but without ceasing to gaze at us, as if they were open onto another reality which was more truly our own and to which they carried us. The gentleness of this glance was like the bejeweled island set in a sea of nectar, of which the ancient texts tell us. How can anyone who has once looked in this way, only once in the universe, perish? This glance will never be lost, because it is the supreme achievement of an artist creator. It will return one day, and whoever possesses it once more will be she herself. To be looked at in this way, once more in this world, I would give everything, even the city of dawn. When I left the house that night, I had once again become the suitor. The Supplication I placed the palms of my hands together, thus uniting earth, water, blood, fire, air, and ether, all that I possessed, and I began to describe her. I was her mirror. Look at yourself in me, Halloween. Contemplate your divine beauty. 
Your hair is a waterfall of gold which hangs down to your waist. Your forehead is wide and pale like the disk of the moon. Your brows are delicately arched. Your lashes are like the rays of the light of the sun of gold, which brings us the premonition of the black sun. When your eyes rest upon me, they transport me to the indescribable world of the ray of green light. Your nose is so slender that air can scarcely enter it. Your cheekbones protrude slightly and bathe your cheeks in soft shadows. Your mouth is a delicious fruit. Milk and honey are under your tongue. And your chin, with a tiny cleft in the middle, shows the sweetness of that fruit. Your long, firm neck rises out of your sweetly shaped shoulders. On the soft skin of your arms grow fields of young summer wheat. Your hands express your whole personality. You are in them forever, in their fingers which create, speak, and love. If one were ever to be touched by them, one's whole life would change. The outline of your long legs can be seen through the cloak that covers them, and your bare feet are like young deer before whom one would shed tears of adoration. She trembled as if from sudden cold. She took hold of my hands. Separate your earth, water, blood, fire, air, and ether. They do not belong to you yet. The light of the sun of gold brings you the vision of my body, but in reality it is to be found in the black sun, or better still, in the brilliant radiance of the ray of green light. You will have to go there to be united with it. The pleasure which I can give you here with my body, my caress, the touch of my lips, is nothing to what awaits you beyond this world, in the union of our souls. Bodily pleasure is sad, disjointed, transitory. It blots out the light of another pleasure, which has no beginning nor end. Chastity is the world of the giants. Lovers who only pursue the joys of visible flesh have never succeeded in becoming united, nor in loving each other. When they lie side by side in their beds, they are nevertheless far apart, separated by an impassable thread of air, by the sword of forgetfulness, because they will never dream the same dream. Each of them pursues his solitary road without his companion. Only when lovers are capable of dreaming the same dream are they truly lovers, when they love one another in their dreams. I will teach you to dream the same dream, and we will also love each other with our other bodies, which are invisible to the mortal eye. Only in this way will our love be indestructible, eternal. In this turn of the wheel, we have reached midday. We know who we are. This is our great chance to get out of the circle forever, and for you to discover the entrance to the interior earth. The Path of a Moor I lived in her house. I slept in the quadrangular anteroom. From there I would walk down the narrow corridor, which was always in shadow, to the room with the window open onto a garden filled with fruit trees. Every morning, a tiny bird with blue wings came and woke her with its trilling. She would say to it, Tiny bird singing, at my window, Thank you, my tiny bird, for the beautiful morning. In the evenings, we would sit in the wicker chairs beside the open window. That was where we initiated the grand design of dreaming the same dreams along our path of a moor. These dreams are not dreams, she explained to me. They are not those sequences of unconnected images, those confused organic states, which people wish to interpret at all costs as products of a vivid subconscious intelligence, corresponding to the restless, seething activities of an energy which is at work while the body is at rest. Our dream is a more elevated form of consciousness. It attains a greater intensity, a purer tonality, a superconsciousness in a state of continuous consciousness which is no longer either mine or yours. It is as if the dream was dreaming us, or as if we were dreaming ourselves through this dream, as if we were watching someone dreaming our own lives, and we are also this someone 
who is not really us. This is perhaps the only possible way to supersede the ego and make him into you, that is, me. And all this is for the greater glory and life of that someone who is waiting beside a spring in order to be able one day to contemplate his face, that is, my face. Sitting in her wickerwork chair, she placed her hands together in her lap, looked straight at me for a moment, then closed her eyes slowly as she sang a melodia. I traced the first sign of the order on my chest, reciting a mantra as I did so. They were both going to work on the spiritual bodies. I also crossed my hands, thus creating the number eight with four fingers. I looked closely at her beautiful face, so as to remember it as clearly as possible, and then I closed my eyes as well, turning them inwards and concentrating them on a point between my eyebrows. I thought I heard her moan softly and mutter. Then I felt someone nearby, standing beside me, and then I was aware of nothing more, because spiral currents caused first my head and then my body to vibrate, and I began to sway to and fro like a pendulum. A metal tube with a revolving inside appeared in front of me, and I felt myself passing through it, slowly at first, then ever more rapidly. At the end of the narrow tunnel, a faint blue light began to glimmer. Then I found myself running along a narrow passageway, which was a gallery of glass, like that in my childhood home, but much longer and filled with pictures in wooden frames and furniture that I thought I recognized. I ran faster because I knew that I must hurry to reach the end of the passageway before a door closed, or because I wouldn't be able to retain the image of this gallery in my mind for much longer, or to continue imagining it. Because all this was in some way taking place in my imagination, since I was able to imagine something that really existed somewhere in someone else's imagination as well as in my own. Finally, I managed to get out of myself and found myself standing in a patio bathed in a mobile, transfigured light, like the light of dawn or dusk, a light from another universe, a newborn light. A young girl was carving statues, and a man's voice sang, The time of the golden fruits is long past, the frozen stone the cold wind that comes from the sea. O oh, friendly hearts, where have you gone? The old home awaits us in vain. Father I found myself in an uncultivated spot which looked like a clearing in some forest. Men were working on a building site. I could see the foundations and the scaffolding. Some young men were climbing ladders, carrying building materials. I thought I might be able to help them. Then the site manager saw me. He walked over to a console on which stood a telephone and rang somebody. I realized that he was talking to my dead father. He seemed to be telling him that I had arrived and asking him for instructions. My father was living by himself in a nearby city and couldn't leave it because he was looking after a child, another child. When I realized that he was on the other end of the telephone, I asked the site manager to let me speak to him. He handed me the phone. Father, it's me. There was a silence. Then I heard him say my name. I'm coming to see you, I told him. No, not yet. Very well, I said. I will obey you. I felt terribly sad. The line went dead. Of course, I understood the reason. And I walked away through the clearing, saying, I must journey even farther until I find the oasis of the Isis, the ancient garden, the ancestral home, the ultimate smile, the sweet indifference, until I join my father again, who died long ago. Pale traveler, behold the wind, behold all that was lost, the little that was gained. Behold the sea again. Again, the man's voice sang, Turn away no more. Why wilt thou turn away? The starry floor, the watery shore, 
is given thee till the break of day. The secret chamber. In the house there was a secret chamber, known to no one but me. I discovered the way to it when I explored some darkened rooms. There I would mount a narrow staircase which I never climbed right to the top. A little before I reached it, I would turn aside and begin to climb imaginary flights of steps in the air or projecting from the wall. When I reached the roof, I would push aside some boards to reveal a tiny entrance. This was the most difficult part because I had to slide into this hole and crawl along a very narrow, airless passageway. If I was able to reach the end, I would find myself in a wide, impregnable chamber, an inviolate paradise. There were chests full of precious materials, garments from every period which I had worn in the past. The centuries had come together. I would always find myself alone there. The chamber was divided into compartments where there were beds covered with skins and shelves full of carefully classified books. A fire was always burning and armor hung on the walls. No one would ever know where I was. I was completely safe. I had disappeared from the house. But as time passed, as the years slipped away, I found it increasingly difficult to return to this secret hiding place and did so less and less often. I felt that it was not the same as before, not as impregnable, that a wall that used to protect it had been destroyed and that other people knew of its existence and used to visit it, entering it freely from all sides. Its secrecy was being lost, and the gods love secrecy. Energy and dreams decay, rot and grow old. If this mysterious chamber were to be lost, if I were no longer able to visit it or live in it, a whole world would have sunk beneath the sea. The Plumed Serpent A gentle blow, a shudder, and I was back in my body again, sitting facing her as she looked at me in silence. She had returned before me. I went alone, without you, I said. I passed my hand across my forehead, exhausted. Symbols, symbols. Symbols, she repeated, joining together what was dispersed. This time my eyes closed of their This time my eye This time my eyes closed of their own accord. I couldn't concentrate. Then I was outside myself. I was walking through some hills. To the west lay the city of Santiago, enveloped in a cloud. Beyond it, the coastal cordillera. To the north, far below, lay some blue lakes in the middle of plowed fields. To the east and south stretched the vast Andean cordillera, the high peaks of El Plomo and La Paloma, eternally snow-covered. All around me were slopes covered in soap-bark trees, jallops, terebinths, hundred-year-old lindens, almond trees, and hawthorns. There were three hills. On the middle one stood a house with a circular, conical roof made of sandstone. On the highest hill stood an octagonal tower. I had the curious impression that this house and this tower belonged to me. I walked towards the tower along a path bordered by cinnamon trees. I went round its eight sides without finding an entrance. I walked down once more to the middle hill and opened the door of the house. As always, there was a fire blazing in the circular hall. Indian choapinos were spread on the floor. The rooms in this house had doors opening onto the hall, corresponding to divisions of the number eight, like the thickness of the walls and the height of the building. Without hesitating, I walked over to the chimney and pressed gently on a stone. A hole appeared in the inside wall, rapidly, Moving in the same way each time so as to not be caught by the fire, I leapt into the hole before the stone moved back into place again with a dull thud. I found myself standing beside a staircase carved out of the rocky mountainside. 
I climbed down its sixteen steps and walked along a passageway lit by a filtered light. Blazing torches were also fixed to the walls. The floor was covered with a choapina with runic drawings. Another wall suddenly appeared in front of me. I opened another entrance in it in the same way, with a gentle pressure of my fingers, and I found myself inside the tower. I climbed up a staircase carved out of the wall until I reached an octagonal room with windows on all sides. The room was in darkness because heavy curtains had been drawn across the windows and night had already fallen. In the middle of the room was a nuptial bed. Two candelabras, which gave out a weak light, stood on a pair of wooden pillars. This bed was made out of stone. It was cold. Lying on it was Halloween. Her hands were crossed on her breast, and she was holding a Quetzal feather. She appeared to be dead, but she was alive. She was scarcely breathing, and her face was the color of ice. I stood at the head of the stone bed. I seemed to understand that, in her sleep, she was blocking an opening that led to or from somewhere. When I woke her, we would be able to pass through this passage. I waited. I did nothing. She was so beautiful in her immobility. I remembered her in her other deaths, always the same, when she lay motionless holding her Quetzal feather. I was inspired to trace the sign that would wake her. The sign vibrated and she sat up on her stone bed, opening the passage which allowed us, together this time, to fly over the mountains, almost grazing their peaks, as if we were in a luminous disc or covered in Quetzal feathers, as if we were the fiery serpent of Quetzalcoatl. Zarathustra. I recognized these regions. They were those of the peak of Melamoyu, Ultima Esperanza, and the Sarmiento Mountains. From this altitude, we could just make out the confused outline of the Torres de Pain, far off in the distance, between snowstorms and mists. They were the borderlands, the limits, the entrance to the city of the Caesars and to the interior earth had to lie somewhere in that remote area. But we had come here to pay homage to the bones of the Milodon, that is, to a far distant past which also belonged to us, to the memory of another turn of the wheel. We landed on the steep slopes of Mount Melamoyu, the tiny lake of dark green water and the forest of petrified beaches were still there. But there was now no human habitation to be found at this altitude, only snow and rock. We walked round the lake. In the ice of the shore could be seen some lines, like the tracks of a primitive sledge. Some petrified leaves and branches could be seen through the centuries-old layer of ice. A rock rose up in the shape of a pyramid, leaning a little towards the water, which reflected the shadows of the forest and the mountain peak in its unfrozen part. Now I remembered it all. It seemed only yesterday, yet centuries had passed. Of course, she couldn't be buried here, I said to myself, because she was standing beside me. Ah, and if I were to open the tomb, the icy wind would certainly blow away these ancient memories, this age-old snow and a scent of sandalwood and resin would envelop the world. I began to dig with my bare hands until the blood ran from under my nails, dyeing the white snow red, and it coagulated like a copahue on an ice floe. She watched me in silence, leaning against the rock, with her red cloak covering her down to her bare feet. I opened the tomb. Her body appeared intact, on a bed made of cinnamon branches, copy hues, and laurel which were still wet with my tears from other centuries. Again, I embraced this body desperately, forgetting the one which was standing beside me, looking at her own dead face. Gently, she took me by the shoulders and tried to lift me up. Close the tomb, 
The time has not yet arrived when all my deaths can become one single life. The sun was nearing its midday zenith. Its light fell directly over the rock. Where was this rock in reality? Didn't a mirage of the midday light project it onto the slope of a mountain in the south of the world? Wasn't it really in an alpine village in another part of the globe? But in the disturbance of the light, which had inverted space as if it were making a hole and creating a break in time, the wounded king again appeared. He didn't see us. He was rooted in his years. Seated beside the rock, he held in one hand his slender walking stick, and in the other his wide-brimmed hat. He was dressed in black. His eyes were fixed on the mountains which formed an amphitheater around the lake. Thick forests of oak and pine covered the slopes. Streams flowed down them. He recited quietly, Oh, how long the road appears, how uncertain in the night, without the star. I want to live twice, now that I can look into your eyes. Like a sweet promise, the light of triumph, and the morning. Oh, you, most beloved of the gods, who kissed the stone, for the first time, enamored of a tomb. Already youthful summer clambers up the mountain. It begins to speak. O oh, little bird, what have you done? What mystery is concealed in your song that you arrest my steps? Traveler, my melodies are not for you. I am calling my companion, because without her the night is sad. Do not stop. Continue your journey. You stop, pale one, condemned to wander in deep winter, like the vapor that pursues, the coldest regions of the sky. Flee, bird, sing in the desert, and hide, since you were mad, your bleeding heart beneath the ice. Tears ran down the cheeks of the wounded king. It is midday. The sun is blazing directly above my head. Silence, silence. Hasn't the world just become complete? What is happening to me? Every corner of my soul is expanding. Golden sadness lies heavily upon it, and happiness also. O oh, bliss, sing, my soul. This is the secret, solemn hour in which no shepherd plays his pipe. Don't sing, birds of the valleys. O oh, my soul, don't even whisper. Aged midday is sleeping moving his lips, a drop of old happiness, of golden happiness, of golden wine. That is how the gods laugh. Silence. What has happened to me? Listen. Hasn't time flown? Aren't I about to fall? Haven't I fallen into the well of eternity? Ah, break my heart after such good fortune. He seemed to see us, to sense our presence in this confusion of light and time. You have given yourselves up to dreaming. For how long? Half an eternity. Then get up now, old heart. How much time will you need to wake up after such a dream? O oh, midday sky above me, when will you drink that drop of dew that has fallen on all the things of this world? When will you drink this singular soul? When, O oh wells of eternity, when, O oh abysses of midday which make men tremble, when will you absorb my soul in you? The desert grows. Woe to him whom the desert hides. What says the depth of midnight? I was asleep, I was asleep, but now I have woken out of deep dreaming. My midnight is my midday. Oh, I love you, eternity. You alone are the woman by whom I wish to have a son. And then, as he looked at us and we saw him, through that break in the light, as he was still sitting there waiting, but without waiting for anything, and estranged from good as well as from evil, and enjoying the sun and also the shade for once, while he gave himself up to the midday, the forest, the lake and the limitless time, suddenly he divided into two, and Zarathustra passed beside him. We bowed before his earth. The Orphic Music
When we dreamed the same dream, when we went on these journeys or flights, our conversation took place in a different state of consciousness integrated with a broader ego, which, so to speak, received us or awaited us on another side, as if it were waiting for us beside a spring. And we communicated with each other not by means of the words which are commonly used to represent the things of this earth, but by means of that language which underlies all the languages in the world, behind the mask of words. We often used Sanskrit terms because, although this was a dead language on the second earth, it was still a living one on the other, first earth, and approximated more closely to that music of the spheres, which is the language of the mind, Vajra Sita, the Orphic Kabbalah, the Hiranyagarbha, Kabda, a language of cosmic spiritual sounds, sacred and divine letters called Maktka, little mothers, letters of light, Biha, seminal syllable, root syllable, made of ether. From this stems the mantra, the language of Akasa, memory of the light. Whosoever passes that way transmits telepathically the direct vision of the substance of things, because things come to him desiring to turn into symbols. These nature names are locked into the memory of human beings' consciousness through sleep and not being awake. Akasa is a concept or metaphysical experience which has no equivalent in the terrestrial languages of Kali Yuga. Logos is the closest equivalent for it. We decided to visit the master who told us, you are going on a honeymoon journey. Its Sanskrit name is Urdhavaretas and you are being carried by a bird called A. Delon. You are walking backwards like the Imbunche of the island of Chiloe towards the point of origin, the Golden Age. It is hard, it is difficult to navigate along the rivers against the current in order to reach the mountains where they rise, entering the subterranean cities, the oasis of warm water. The path of eternity, although it leads downwards in the visible body, really leads upwards in the invisible one. Although you are going to the South Pole, to the Antarctic, you will finally reach the continent of Hyperborea at the North Pole, where our guide lies. Because during the great catastrophe, the poles also changed places. You will have to go to the South, which is the North. Mulabanda and Hamurini are the names for this process which re-inverts everything. It is a very secret path which makes the river of your virility and the golden feminine liquid of your beloved run backwards. And you will have to embrace and lose each other again in each city, at each stage of the honeymoon, in this pilgrimage of immortality on which you have embarked. What is this mysterious masculine force which spurs you onwards, Whence comes this will, this heroic initiative which seems to precede the start of the great journey? This is what prevents you turning back on the path. If you were to do so, if you failed to travel the path to its end, you would be guilty because the practices of your initiation have mobilized enormous forces which destroy men and drive them insane if they are not aimed in the right direction. The signs will help you open a way for yourself in the virgin forest where no roads exist. Even the gods are your enemies because their impersonal lives are at risk in this war. You will have to overcome the archetypes, dethrone them, reincorporating their tremendous numerous energies within yourself. Do you remember the Greek legend? Man was a circular androgynous. He began to roll up Mount Olympus. The gods were frightened, fearing defeat, and so they resorted to artifice. They divided the man-sphere in half. The result was that he was so busy trying to find his other half that he had no time to make war on them. But, luckily, the gods made a mistake, 
because one day we will bring them back to life as well, giving them a face. When the water runs downhill, it gives rise to samsara and human generations, to the circular movement of the involuted earth. When it runs uphill, in the opposite direction, it provokes the mutation of the gods themselves, the divinization of the hero. It creates a free, eternal race, without gods, without a king. This is the road of the warrior. And her, I ask, what does she do in all this? She is the female guru, the one who flows in your blood, Vidya. Without her, you will never reach anywhere. She is Aloween, the fifth born of Hyperborea, she who keeps in contact with the star of the point of origin, who possesses the power of Vril and the vision of Urna. She is the priestess of magic love, who unites love and death and turns them into a more, without death, eternal life. She becomes interiorized in you through her death. She inspires you. And you will never have another companion here or in the depths of the tomb. She is your Valkyrie, who will hand you the cup of immortality. The way without her is reduced to the imagination of a rational mind. Only if you are in love can you go beyond your conscious ego. Only with her can you attain a greater degree of consciousness, a state of super-consciousness. Only through journeying together, dreaming together. Because she is this superior form of energy which originates from the submerged continents, from Hyperborea and Atlantis, above and below the terrestrial crust of Kali Yuga. The martial initiation of our order is only for you, for the hero or Vira. This is the honeymoon of the exile. If in the definitive drama which unites the three of us, we need to use our words from an ancient language like Sanskrit, which is completely unknown in the West and almost so in the Orient of Kali Yuga. It is because in the so-called living languages, there are no sacred expressions that can be used to refer to sacred questions or to capture and reflect the symbols of these multiple vibrations, which resound and explode in all the universes simultaneously. Any translation of these terms will always be equivocal and sacrilegious, destroying the living soul of a seemingly dead language, which is not living, which is not dead. Have you ever thought what might have been the language of the white gods, the first people to come to this continent in times immemorial? Before the disappearance of the continent of Mu and Lemuria, during the first civilization of Tiahuanacu and the construction of its legendary monuments, when it was still a seaport and the link with Venus, our star, was permanently maintained, the language consisted of magic signs. The giants directed the course of the stars by means of it. But the language of the white heroes, who came in search of their ancestors in the course of later ages, was more closely connected with Sanskrit than with any other. The Indo-European languages, like German, Ancient Scandinavian, and Latin, have their roots in Sanskrit. The secret language of the Kishe Maya was Zuyua, and that of the Incas was Scandinavian Sanskrit. It is well known that the Inca rulers were white, and that among blood relatives they spoke a private and sacred language, which they never taught to the population of the slaves of Atlantis. Certain words will give us the key. Inca is really Inga, as the Spanish conquistadors spelt it. In Old High German, Ing means derivation, ancestor, lineage. Merovingian, for example, has this root, meaning he who comes from Mount Meru, because Mero is Meru and Ving is Weg, the German for road. Thus, the Inga and we who are his descendants are those who journey from Mount Meru in the great exodus, from far away, from the nuptial homeland, from the lost land of Avalon, 
In reality, from the continent of Hyperborea, from the morning star, and also from the holy mount Kailas, which is the physical and visible double of the invisible Mount Maru, where a center of our order existed, a huilka, a fortress in Quisha, a circle. Our circle is called Huilkanota, coming from vil, hidden, and ka, mystery, in Sanskrit. Anka Huinka also comes from there, meaning initiated eagle, initiate of the condor, initiated bird, Manutara, which is also a Sanskrit word. The central city of the Incas was called Cusco, navel of the world, like Lhasa in Tibet, like the sacred city of the Druids, the middle city, with an Omphalos. The mysterious bird, al Kamari, from which the Inca obtained his two feathers, black and white, is also associated with the Inca with a K. From there, he derives his magic dignity, Korak Inca, Korak Inca. Korak derives from the Sanskrit Karava, raven, thus directly linking the Inca with the great war of the Mahabharata, with the Kauravas, the name of one of the factions in this cosmic struggle. Korakenke is therefore the raven of the Inca, of the Inca king, Wotan, perhaps Garuda, the vehicle of Vishnu. Korak also comes from the Hyperborean Sea, Kara, in the Arctic, where the great exodus of Kali Yuga begins, the end of the Golden Age, and the real twilight of the White Gods, of the magic bird al Kamari, of the Hyperborean Raven of Wotan. Our white god is called Huira Kocha. Huider means white, and Kocha is an aboriginal deformation of the old German word god, white god. The sacred book of the priestly caste of the Mayan white initiates is the Codex of Chica Castanango, the Popol Vuh. Popol is people in Latin, and Buk is book in German. The book of the people of the white gods, in which it is also related that they came from Tule, Tula, or Thule. This document has been totally adulterated and mutilated by the missionaries and by the great planetary conspiracy against the white gods. If we search with a pure heart and an open soul, in the whole of America, Albania, we will find the sacred language, Sanskrit, which is the involuted resonance of the inaudible Orphic Kabbalah, that of the mantras of the Hyperborean magicians, the giants and the men gods. Mantrayana is the road of the mantra, of the search for the mantra. It is in the Indo-Germanic languages of Sanskrit origin that one will find the meaning of the word buin, for example, which appears in Peru and Chile, bole and bulu, bull in Old High German, the sacrificial bull, the solar bull, in a land where cattle didn't exist, perhaps the ox, Nandi, the vehicle of Siva Lucifer. Chakra means grange in Quichua, a circular plot of land. Kaakra means circle, wheel, a turn of the wheel, in Sanskrit. Making the wheel turn is the road which you are following at present. Vajarayana in Sanskrit, road of diamond, of immortality, until you succeed in becoming Chakravarti, the lord of the chakras, the master of a chakra. Kunani in the language of Cusco, the language of the Amata, its astrologer sages, means to preach. In Sanskrit, Kun means to direct, to direct Kundalini. The writing of the most ancient lost world of the white gods was also that of our signs, that of the warrior heroes who rebuilt Tiahuanacu, that of the Atu Marunas, and also that of the Mayas was the runes, the Kelikas, in the style of the plowing of the ox, the Bustrophedon of the most ancient Scandinavian runes. 
This is also the way in which the speaking tablets of Easter Island, the Rongo Rongo, which no one has yet been able to decipher, was written. The sacred writing, which the Incas later prohibited, was lineal. For all these reasons, we, the initiates of southern Hyperborea, always return to this seemingly dead language, which is in fact only asleep and which must be revived, Sanskrit, demolishing a quichua pirka, a Sanskrit prick, behind which is hidden the secret, going backwards, ever further backwards, Hamurani in quichua, from the Sanskrit mantra Ham, from the Vishuddha chakra in the throat, returning to the point of origin, to the nuptial homeland, where we will also find the deep magico-symbolic meaning of the name of our sacred land. Chile, Chile, Chill, to bear, in Quichimaya. It comes from the Old Flemish, which in turn derives from the Old German, Schillen, meaning unsheath, with an even more distant origin in Hyperborean Sanskrit. To bear, unsheath the sword, the sacred sword of the homeland of our initiation, or the initiation of the mystic homeland, because Chile is shaped like a sword which must be unsheathed, a double-edged sword. This is the road of our initiation, of the warriors of the solitary star, the watchers of the dawn, the pilgrims of the dawn. Master, I said to him, the less I understand you, the more I love you. Yes, the less you understand me, the wiser you become. The Metamorphosis of the Elephant, in which the War of the Mahabharata begins. I am walking across the desert, sand, golden sand. The desert stretches away, San Pedro de Atacama. Geysers spout on the horizon. I have reached the walls of a city which is preparing itself for war. Its gates are closed. It is nighttime. No one is guarding them. I speak the word that opens them. Lamb. I reach a central square shaped like an inverted triangle. The streets are empty, but the square is guarded by soldiers in battle dress. There are chariots and horses. The majority of the soldiers are sleeping on the stony ground. I sit down beside them and question them. A great war is about to begin because the land of the seas has announced that its forces are going to carry off the queen Draupadi. The enemy fleet has already taken the ports, and the attack will begin at daybreak. The king, seated on his throne, has turned his face towards both sides so that he appears to have two heads. This signifies that his forces must fight to the last man. I tell them that I am going to fight alongside them. Then sleep overcomes me and I don't awake until the sun begins to rise over the desert. The war chariots and armies are milling around. They are moving off towards the walls of the city. I realize that an extraordinary phenomenon has taken place while I was asleep. I have woken to feel myself to be me, and yet not me. Sometimes I am me, and more frequently I feel as if I am part of someone else, who is the one who is experiencing all this, including me. I see the king approach, riding on an elephant. His crowned head is turned towards the north and the south at one and the same time. As he passes by, he looks at this man who is me, and then he seems to have four faces. There is great sadness in his expression. It is the expression of one who knows what destiny lies ahead of one who knows that he is going to lose. The king's face is pale because he suffers from white leprosy. His name is Pandu. The elephant walks heavily towards the walls beyond which death and transfiguration 
await him. He raises his trunk and trumpets his battle cry. Close at hand is a chariot drawn by two impatient chargers. The charioteer signals to the man who is me to climb in and pick up the shield and lance. This man jumps in and puts on the caress and the helmet. He sees that the color of the driver is blue. The chargers leap forward, and in a flash they are outside the gates of the city, rushing headlong across the sands in a mad gallop. Very soon they find themselves facing the enemy lands, and in them the man sees his relatives, his compatriots from northern Chile. He turns towards the charioteer and lays down his arms. I cannot fight, he says. I can see my brothers. I know all these people. Chileans, Peruvians, Bolivians, Argentinians. Imperiously, the charioteer commands him, Acquit yourself of your duty, O warrior of the race of the white gods. You will not kill anybody. Those who died today are already dead in me. The war between brothers, the great war of the worlds, which began here in these desert sands, fought for the possession of a woman and the city of the elephant, called Astinapura, and also Troy, Tokepia, and San Pedro de Atacama, raged for months, years. The woman lies sleeping, pale, infected with sacred leprosy, in some secret central place. The battle for the desert has been lost, and the forces are falling back inside the walls of the city of the elephant. Everything round here smells. The sands, the walls, the stones, the thistles, the wounds, even the bones smell. It is said that this is the city of smell, of the first perfume. The charioteer has abandoned him inside the triangle in the center of the city. In reality, it is an oasis with gardens of semi-tropical vegetation, with exquisite fruits, papayas, pineapples, mango trees, and a huge fig tree in the middle, which seems to touch the sky. The flowers are very beautiful and are watered invisibly. Water is the enemy of this world. The priests of the temple know that water is going to destroy everything, and they pray to the serpent of the earth, Tenten, who alone is capable of combating the serpent of the waters, Kai Kai. A mirror of gold hangs in the center of the temple, a sun of gold. He enters the palace and finds his way to the room in which lies the woman who has unleashed the great war of the Mahabharata, who might be the wife of the friends and the enemies, the Pandavas and Kauravas of the great Bharatas, she who inspires the heroes. As if he has become invisible, he manages to get past the sentries without being seen. No one will ever be able to see him but her. He walks through the door of her chamber and stands beside the bed on which she lies sleeping. A dog is guarding her. He recognizes it. It is there because this is the world of smell, its favorite language. The dog also recognizes him and comes and licks his bloody feet. In ecstasy, as always, he gazes at the face of the sleeping woman. She is so beautiful in sleep that he doesn't wish to wake her. He strokes her forehead with his fingers. He touches her golden hair softly and speaks the word which will bring her back to life. Hum. In the hollowness of the room, it re-echoes like the bellowing of the mythological bull. Moo. She opens her eyes and a moan escapes from her breast. She sits up and her hair resembles an irresistible fire. Oh, she sighs, I have slept for such a long time. At last you have come. I thought that this time we would lose each other. How is this war going? I dreamed that the sea would submerge our world. Tremendous forces will be used in the struggle, but we still have a little time left for our amour. The difficult test once again. The city holds out for a full year. During this time, they stay inside the room. The dog guards the door. 
The noise of the fighting doesn't reach this far. They realize that the decisive hour is approaching for their world. From time to time, they look through the windows at the garden. In it grows a tree whose top touches the sky. This tree of paradise bears no fruit, it is barren. Up it climb some men inflicted by the same disease, eaten away by this white leprosy. For four months, he slept at the foot of the woman's bed, and for another four, to her left, in the bed. She always lay on her right side, resting her head in the palm of her hand. She always lay on her right side, resting her head in the palm of her hand. He felt her shoulder very close to him, and her thighs covered only by the thin red gown. Afterwards, he slept for four months to her right, and then, in his waking dream, her hair and her soft, perfumed breath were an intoxicating liquor that transported him to that place inhabited by the people of dreams, who talked to him only of her, using the word Aropa. Thus, in twelve months, she became transformed into a goddess, taking possession of his essences, flowing through his blood, filling his cells like the female guru, completely idealized, the matrix of transcendental knowledge. Now, he couldn't even think of touching her with the tips of his fingers. If during the night he occasionally touched her veils through some involuntary movement, he would wake with a start, feeling he had committed sacrilege, and would move over to the very edge of the bed. The physical had been integrated into the supraphysical, evoking a supernatural presence. It flowed through the blood of his spirit. When the time had arrived, she asked the dog to leave. She opened the windows and let in the morning light. A bluebird came and trilled his song for them both. When darkness fell, the evening star also shone through the windows. She moved into the center of the room, and slowly she began to take off her red gown and her veils. First, her naked shoulders appeared, then her breasts, with their tender, rosy, quivering nipples. The veils dropped further, revealing her stomach, her golden vulva, her long, slender legs, like paths, until they lay beside her tiny feet, covered with sand from the desert. There stood the absolute woman. He felt himself grow faint from looking at her. All his eternity would not suffice him to gaze on her. Very slowly, with a dreamlike motion, she approached him. She reached his side and stretched out her hands to clasp his head. Like the touch of a petal from a flower in the garden of the city of dawn, she pressed her lips to his. She put one of her gentle, perfumed arms round his shoulders and began to undress him with her other hand. She pointed out to him the evening star, which was still shining in the dark, larger than all the other stars in the sky. May it assist us. And she led him to the bed. He felt her moving beside him, naked. She had crossed her hands on her breast and was staring at the sky. Reflections from the firelight played over her beautiful body, running along it like caresses. Without covering themselves, without touching each other, they let the hours pass, in silence, in supreme lucidity and concentration. Until she spoke, my desire for you is reaching its peak. The fire of sacrifice has already been lit in my vulva and beats there like a heart. My other heart is on the point of leaping out of my breast. In this city, the perfume and odors become intensified and reach the roots. I can smell you. I can feel you. My whole being longs to be caressed, touched by your hands and your mouth, so as to fill you with my nectar. My will no longer exists. My impulse is to make you enter me, to be possessed, filled by that flow of supreme virility, by your river of amber. Who will give us the strength to find the narrow path in this long night in which we are gambling our destiny throughout all the turns of the wheel? Quietly, he replied, 
I can feel you too. I smell the subtle dreamlike perfume of your golden fields of wheat, of the flower of your breast, of your golden translucent liquid like crystal drops of dew in the garden of the city of longing, which moistens and transcends your osis. There followed a silence in which she uncrossed her arms, stretched out her hand, and took hold of his. Make your protective sign. Let us drink our liquid gold. Let us not allow it to be lost outside. Let us reabsorb it into our blood so as to experience the pleasure which has no beginning and no end, keeping our resolve firm by making the mudra that destroys fear in order to resist the terrible event to come, the pleasure which has never been experienced by earthly lovers, an ecstatic, continuous pleasure which will accompany us forever inside us, in your blood, where it will flow for an eternity. In her melodious voice, in the deep, velvety silence of that warm night in the city of Astinapura, she pronounced with a ritual cadence the word, Klim. It was as if a seal had been broken. He felt as if he was being enveloped by a huge wave which was submerging everything, countries, continents, the world, everything but her. Locked in an embrace of Amor, they died without death, to be reborn in that sea of nectar, of Soma, united in their breath, their basic perfume, in the idea which produced bodies and forms. And now, nothing more was possible. Saham, I am you, they cried. The blue bird returned to sing at the window, and as the day dawned, the star of him her bathed them in its deep, dewy light. It returned them to that liquid gold which they were driving back to its source, returning them partially to themselves with a gentle, luminous caress. Lamb, they repeated in unison, and it was their farewell to that city which had lost the war. The Secret Marriage They would have to leave before nightfall. The final catastrophe was approaching. Nevertheless, the last ceremony had still to be performed. They had to marry according to the rites of this world, ordained by the white gods. The marriage would be secret and valid for all eternity. The Gandharva marriage. Until now, she had been the wife of a king, the wife of another, of an archetype, Parakia. From tonight, she was his own wife proper, Sphia. Now she would be the initiated bride, Parastri. They bathed together in an effervescent liquid of Soma. Afterwards, he put on a blue cloak and she her red gown. They held wands from which sprouted flowers. They prepared the wedding feast which was also a farewell. The feast called the Feast of the Five M, because it is composed of mudra, cereals, the earth, matia, fish, water, mamsa, meat, fire, madia, wine, air, and maithuna, woman, ether. They had begun at the end with the magic possession. This most ancient ritual was taught by the tantric magicians of Lemuria and by the priestesses of Hyperborea. On the floor, covered by the walls, the liturgical cap, Kalaka, appeared filled with liquid gold. The veils signified that the material drink covered the secret drink, the spirit of the secret wine, the savior in liquid form, the liquor of orgasm, which has no beginning or end. There was a heavenly soma, a spirit of secret wine, a lost liquor of amor, of non-death, which is now only to be found in the river of your blood, going back to its source, to the Isis. She stretched out her hand over the chalice and spoke the word of the mantra of wine, Hrim. They uncovered the cup and drank from that inexhaustible liquor. Because those who have known Amor constantly drink Soma, the liquor which flows through the blood, the Mine, 
the memory of that love which was lost at the beginning of time in the Hyperborean rite of the Minotrinken. And they sang, Fill my cup with wine, it speaks to me in ineffable silence of my beloved who has been reborn in the depths of my blood. And it reveals to me all I need in order to enter the city of transparent ice with her along the path of roses, which leads to the enchanted land of the king of the ghosts. Thus they were married, while the warriors called a halt to the combat in order to surround them with a circle of swords. The pale, sickly king was now able to rest and to make his way to the secret refuge, where the woman who possessed supernatural powers of healing could cure him. They then became the rulers of this world in ruins. One day, their son, riding astride a Hyperborean swan, would come and rebuild it. A clear light poured into the room through the doors and windows. It flooded the city. Without landing in the desert, vibrating in that clear light, the disc called Vimana in the epic poem of the Mahabharata had descended. It had come to rescue them from the impending catastrophe. They managed to enter it before a huge wave submerged everything. The temples, the gardens, the palaces, the continents of Mu and Gondwana. They took the dog with them. From far off, they could see the earth shaken by convulsions, the volcanoes erupting, the mountain ranges beginning to rise, the seas changing position. And on the crest of the biggest wave, the elephant was still swimming, because he had turned into the Leviathan. And what had been his trunk on earth was now a continuous jet of water, like a geyser in the ancient lost desert of Atacama, the navel of the world. On the surviving islands, men of diminished stature, wearing white cloaks, implore the serpent of the earth, stop, Ten Ten. And the serpent of the waters, Kai Kai, has been confined on the borders of the precarious islands of Chiloe. The ruins of Tiahuanacu, now thousands of meters up in the Cordillera of the Andes, the temple of the Kala Sasaya, the ancient entrance to the subterranean world, are no longer in contact with other universes, nor with those who travel through space. Viracocha and Mama Oko no longer come down from Venus, the morning star. The giants have withdrawn into the Andean rock, waiting for the return of the ancient sun. Along the southern canals, beneath the surface of the water, crawls a ship with all its lights on, so that anyone seeing it would take it for a fiery serpent with feathers of flame. It is hunting a white whale, which blinded its captain and drowned its crew, which is now composed of ghosts. If they succeed in capturing it, the ship will rise to the surface of the water, its captain will recover his sight, and the crew will come back to life with bodies of fiery, imperishable matter. He saw this underwater ship from a beach in Chiloe, on the island of Lemoy, and he called out the password which would make the captain heave to, Vam. He swam underwater for a few minutes, accompanied by his dog, and was taken on board El Cayuche. The ship changed course, leaving the southern canals by the Gulf of Penas, where the Leviathan's water spout could be seen in the far distance, and making for the open sea, the huge ocean. For days, they followed the vast expanse of its waters, where once a continent existed in all its glory, filled with palaces, temples, and wisdom, the world of the giants, which was in contact with the stars. Of all this, only an island lost in the vast ocean was left, Tepito Tenua, the navel of the world. The Leviathan disappeared in that direction. The captain of El Cayuche said, follow your destiny as a shipwrecked man. Take a longboat and approach your objective with your back turned, like all good oarsmen. Row backwards, towards the point of origin, upwards. The dog, which had arrived before him, was waiting for him on the shore. The beach was covered with strange, gigantic statues 
called Mohai. The yellow, new sun shone vertically down on them. He examined them with interest, walking round and round their huge mass, searching for an entrance hole in them. A click. How had these vast lumps of basalt got here? How had they moved from Rano Raraku to the Ahu, their platforms? The dog was indicating that he should follow it. They crossed the empty region of Mata Keterani, whose earliest name was Svadishana, the home of her. They were going towards the crater of the volcano called Rano Kao. As he walked, he mentally repeated the phrase he had heard in an old dream. Only the water which emerges from the crater of an extinct volcano can quench the thirst of the pilgrim. Inside, the crater grew the last three Toromiro trees, that red wood. At the foot of these trees, she lay sleeping. The dog lay down at her feet, waiting. He repeated the mantra which would wake her. Hum. And the music which announced her return was like that of a hive of bees maddened by love. In the shade of the last three Toromiro trees, she began to recall ancient times. Nothing has survived of all that glory except this little island, the summit of a huge submerged mountain. Nothing more in that vast expanse of water. Water, water everywhere. We are in the kingdom of the waters, surviving with difficulty. The inhabitants of the lost continent were giants, gods, more than gods. They came from the pole, from the morning star. When everything was submerged by the great wave, some shepherds, slaves of Lemuria, the interbred races of animal men, also escaped to the higher peaks, and the fish, the great fish. In the war between the Pandavas and the Karavas, between the Hanau Ep, the big-eared ones, and the Nanan Mamoko, terrifying forces were used which produced the catastrophe and the malignant radiation spread across the whole world. The statues of Toromira wood, which are to be found on this island, represent those hybrid monsters. The man-fish, the man-insect, the man without flesh. In the ruins of Tiahuanaku, on the Gate of the Sun, there are figures with four fingers and three toes. Someone has recorded the lost world, attempting to reproduce its glories, and also the fruits of its destruction. The sublime art, which has come here from an unknown center, with wood formed from the non-existent blood of a time without memory, is the work of a race of giants who came from the east and from Hyperborea. Subsequently, very different races tried to reproduce that art. Here is a Mohai with a beard, a white god. It belongs to the Ahu Mohai period. These were imitated later, as if people wished to make the vanished white gods, Quetzalcoatl, Huirakocha, Orahona, and the creators of the first Tiahuanaku return. Thus, the Mohai may be said to represent a kind of exorcism practiced in successive waves, after the involution of the divine and the semi-divine began, attempting to force the return of the white gods, the giants, and the golden age by means of the albeit inaccurate reproduction of their figures. They could also be said to be landmarks for their extraterrestrial vehicles, their vimanas, their astras, their manutara, their disks of light, their plumed serpents, in which they disappeared shortly before the cataclysm. The sightless eyes of the Mohai scan the firmament, their closed mouths long to cry out to them. We are still here. We still preserve your memory. You looked like this. Come back. These basalt sculptures are alive. They vibrate magically. The Mohai that are not covered with ivy are those that are still alive. Their faces are turned in every direction, scouring the horizons. Some look towards the Antarctic, 
others towards the North Pole, towards Ultima Thule. Some Mohai stand on promontories jutting out of vertical cliffs above the sea. How did they reach these sites? One of them has fallen into the water and can be seen at low tide. Did they move? Did they walk? It is related that they advanced straight ahead from this crater, seeking their definitive positions. At night, they formed the magic circle, Kula. Their mission was to protect all that had survived on Earth from new floods, like the serpent Tenten. Beneath the Ahu, or pedestal, there is supposed to be an entrance to the subterranean world, the interior Earth. In order to penetrate it, a tiny turning movement of the Moai is supposed to be sufficient for this stone iceberg to move and expose the lower part of its body together with the entrance to the passage which connects with the great polar exits, the gateway of the Temple of Tiahuanaku and the secret entrance to Stonehenge. In a single night, everything stopped as if that moment in time had frozen. Many Mohai remained incomplete, some of them face upwards in their quarries. What happened? What terrible event occurred? Are the Mohai robots or golems? Are they gods who have been petrified? How did they move and change their positions? A force called Vril levitated them, the same force that impelled the golden bird to overcome the force of gravity and disappear among the constellations. There are Mohai in the meditative position, their hands with their long nails folded over their stomachs like Buddhas. No one knows where their first builders came from. The second period is a copy of the initiatic magical first phase. In all this, a great mystery persists, which will only be revealed to man minutes before his new destruction, because one day the sea will take him again. All those who knew the language of the speaking tablets, Rongo Rongo, were butchered. They were called Maoris and were white priests, white magicians, who had escaped from the great catastrophe and had remained on this exterior earth in order to preserve the tradition. They were of the same race as the Dropas of Tibet, the giant Ainos of Japan and China, the Guanches of the Canary Islands, and the Chachapoyas and Guayaquis of South America. The Rongo Rongo could read the tablets. Their last survivors were killed in the gold mines of Peru, where they had been taken to work as slaves. The script was hermetic, with more than one meaning, like that of ancient Egypt. One sacerdotal, the other demoniacal. Perhaps this was why the Ingas prohibited writing in their empire. As in Egypt, an unknown lineal script existed prior to ideographic script. There are no more than 20 speaking tablets to be found throughout the world. Similar script is not to be found either in Polynesia, nor among the Ingas, nor elsewhere, only the ideographic language of chords and knots of Peru. The reconstruction of the civilization of Tiahuanaku, together with that of this island of Mata Kiterani, is the work of the Vikings, who knew of the priestly, warrior caste of the Big-Eared Ones, their Hyperborean ancestors. Some of the signs carved on rocks correspond to their runic script and to the votive cult of Wotan. In Chile, this fragile strip of land which is all that survives of the old submerged world. The last civilization of the giants flourished before they were imprisoned in the mountains. There is a mysterious link between this island, which guards the great secret, and that sacred land, which today is called Chile, which stretches like a psychic spinal column of the planet as far as the other pole. Also like a drawn sword, an ominous age occurred there when the Valkyries turned into Amazons because they had been left outside by the giants. And the matriarchy of the Amazon, Gaibomia, made war on the descendants. And the matriarchy of the Amazon, Gaibomia, 
made war on the descendants of Khan Tiski Huiracocha, who had also diminished in stature. The fire consumed everything. The Mohai and the ancient objects made of real Toromira wood are charged with the vibrations of Vril. The tablets which disappeared were like the stone which fell from heaven and contained the law of the extraterrestrial race and the secret of the entrances to the hollow earth and to the passages beneath the ocean, which connect with all the surfaces of the new continents, which emerged after the catastrophe. Chile and Japan are regularly devastated by earthquakes. Volcanoes erupt throughout the entire fiery arc of the Pacific in memory of the horrific conflagration that destroyed the world, the ancient moon, and the ancient sun. The Mohai keep their sightless eyes open in eternal vigilance, trying to prevent the repetition of the catastrophe. They are here to hold back a new flood. The expressions on their faces change with the passage of the seasons and the solstices, but the way to overcome and escape the cataclysm is only to be found in the Manu Tara, the man bird, the Manu of the age of Aquarius, which will replace the age of the fish of Leviathan, the white whale, which was once the elephant. Now we are in the kingdom of the waters. You will have to learn to walk on the waters, make yourself lighter, rise into the air. Halloween, sitting under the last three Toromiro trees in the crater of the volcano called Rano Kau, making the mudra which destroys fear, recited the prayer of the lost continent of Lemuria. The green god who controls the three paths of the high resounding sun comes from the year of Orur to the land of the rain clouds in the same way as the thunder roars. In the house of the great fish, beneath the three surviving trees, we dream of immortality. In the top of these trees, where their branches intertwine, meditates the three-eyed one, whom the man-insect fears, the adored third eye, where our star is born. The Initiation of the Manu Tara He was fainting from thirst inside that crater, and not only from a physical thirst. His thirst was for that queen of Rapanui called Rakini. I want to do something with my hands, carve a mohai, but I am so tired. Weariness and lassitude overcome me on this island. Carve your own statue your mohai place it on its ahu make a statue of yourself seat yourself in the center of the toromiro flower she took him by the hand and led him out of the crater to a cave in the mountains this is the cave of the god make make in former times children were brought here and left in the darkness so that their skin would turn white in memory of the lost gods you must stay here for a year until you become the Manu Tara, the man bird. You will then be accepted as king of this island and your real name will be given to that year. This cave is called Hakrongo Manu, the hearer of the bird, of the cry of the bird. When you have triumphed, when you are king, I will be your queen. For now, I shall only accompany you in your thoughts I shall be your Valkyrie in the battle. O warrior of the race of the white gods, fight this battle to the end and lose it in the name of our god of the defeated of the Kali Yuga. Overcome the terrifying waters. Our Amor is again at stake. For months he remained in the darkness of the cave. The faithful dog pro For months he remained in the darkness of the cave. The faithful dog brought him food. Slowly, he lost track of the time and whether it was day or night. His senses became blunted with the exception of his sense of taste and an incontrollable impulse which drove him to seize hold of stones and rocks with his hands and even with his feet. 
He wanted to sculpture something to shape the basalt, the toromiro, any hard material. He had visions, nightmares. The whale became a tyrannical mother who forced him to drink her milk. Then she devoured him. Inside the enormous body of the Leviathan, he felt safe. It was a whole universe. There he met the people of dreams again. Each of them played a different musical note and made the letters of the six petals of the Toromiro flower vibrate. Tiredness and lassitude might have made him spend an entire lifetime in this world, but with an immense effort he overcame this feeling and searched for a vulnerable spot in the monstrous body of the Mother Leviathan. It took light years to move from one point of that body to another. There were countries, continents of fat, veins, rivers of opaque oil, oasis of heat in the midst of this bulky universe, this world of icy lymph. And finally, he managed to escape and stood on the outside. It was an almost superhuman triumph to have found a way out of the safe depths of the mother's protection into the insecurity and pain of the other world. Then he began to scream like a newborn child with a pale skin inside that other mother, the cave of Hakrongo Manu. He went from mother to mother, from circle to circle. How to break out of the final mother? How to escape from the circle of the circles? This is the liquid road, he heard her say from within his blood, the road of tears. The land of tears is mysterious. Dreams about water. As soon as he escaped from the mother Leviathan, he began to wander round the interior of the cave in his dreams, and he discovered paths that led him up hills with houses built on their slopes. There were villas and mansions with wrought iron porches and doorways. Waterfalls and cascades channeled naturally along the gorges between the hills flowed down the slopes. He stopped in front of a latticework doorway at the foot of a hill. A serrated iron wheel controlled the gate of the pool that collected the water which flowed down the hillsides. He allowed himself to act on an impulse and turned the wheel, opening the gate. The water gushed out. He wanted to turn the wheel back to its original position, but the water was already uncontrollable. It flooded down the slopes on all sides, from the hilltops through the gorges. He ran to find himself a safe place. The dreams about water continued. He continued to try and escape along the valleys, between the mountains. An enormous wave broke over a high mountain peak, and the vast mass of water began to rush down its slopes as well. He began to climb the slope to his left, but the compact mass of water, which was crystal clear despite its great volume, began to submerge even the highest mountains. He found himself lying in the cave once more. It was either night or daybreak. He saw her appear emerging naked out of the waters. She called to him from the shore. The vast sea lay enveloped in the half-light of dawn. She had come to meet him from the far distance, from the horizon. Now they would enter the sea together and swim away. Where to? The sea was covered with sargasso. A final dream. He was still swimming. He was floating in the waters of a bay in which ships lay at anchor. A current carried him out to sea. He struggled to escape from it. He found himself surrounded by high waves, which became ever more menacing. His strength deserted him. Then the waters changed color, becoming imbued with turquoise, amethyst, and emerald. And then they were no longer sea water, but a sea of twilight, causal water. Some men swam towards him through this liquid color and rescued him. He looked out of the mouth of the cave. The waning moon shone in the sky over Mata Kitarani. 
He had passed from the lower waters to the heavenly waters, transmuting them to their first level beyond the earth. On the ground at the mouth of the cave sparkled a moonstone. The Baptism of the Man-Bird In the depths of the cave, he concentrated on the moonstone between his eyebrows and made the second sign of his initiation while he repeated the mantra of water, Vam. Vibrations rose along his spine, up his Toromiro tree, as red as the flames of the fiery serpent. The serrated wheels turned, the gates opened, the water's electricity was freed. At that point, the rebellious swimmer, the ego, fought against the current. It refused to accept its approaching death, which maybe was not death, but resurrection in another ego amplified by the earth, water, and fire in which the Manutara bird would rise up out of its ashes. Nevertheless, something had changed in that split second of doubt. At some moment during that secret, imprecise happening, the ego had shown resistance to the god of the losers, becoming paralyzed, caught between two worlds, as if in an upside-down sky, unable either to go back towards the point of origin, upwards in triumphant defeat, or to go down towards its starting point. In vain, the serrated wheels turned wildly and the petals of the non-existent Toromiro flower fell because it was unable to make its non-existence a reality. He realized that he was going to be destroyed in that powerful current from the vibrations of a fire which could not find an exit because the road of the third Toromiro tree had been closed to it. His secret channels, his brain, would disintegrate. He had begun to see blood spots. The exit to another state, to a different feeling, had been blocked. In the embryonic, occult physiology, something remained incomplete, because the conscious, rational ego had introduced an obstacle, because it didn't want to be overpowered and pushed aside, because it wanted to control the uncontrollable. He realized that his final moment on that earth had arrived, that his bodies, including the physical one, wouldn't be capable of resisting the vibrations. His brain was going to explode. He only had a short time left in this world. In the blackness of the cave of Hakrongomanu, he saw a metal basin of water appear in the air before him, level with his chest, and he heard her order him, quickly plunge your hands into the water and splash it over your body. A delicious coolness calmed the fire of the vibrations. An indescribable sensation of peace enveloped him, and he felt his body being galvanized by a powerful energy. He had risen from his ashes. He was as red as the Toromiro tree. Baptized by lustral waters, the primus homo terranus had become the secondus homo coalestus. His name was Manu Tara, the living man-bird, ready to spread his wings and fly off on a new adventure to the loss of a greater city on the left-handed road mapped out by the god of the defeated of Kali Yuga to the rebirth of the Golden Age. The Cry of the Bird He had been in the cave for a year. Now he could leave it. He ran towards the sea and plunged off the cliff top into the water. In his dive, he managed to touch the submerged Mohai. Then he swam towards the tiny island of Hapumanu, the cry of the bird. There he waited. He also looked for the Manutara's egg. One day, the bird flew over him and dropped it into his hand. Then he shaved off his hair and eyebrows tied a sling around his forehead and placed the egg in it. Swimming back to the island, he looked like a mythological being which had surfaced out of the primordial waters, been born from the waters. In reality, he was the twice-born, 
and he wore a sling made of sandalwood around the arm which had caught the egg. During the whole of the following year, he wouldn't be able to touch anything with that hand. He was the keeper of the energy of the surviving island, and of the Mohai, who scour the horizons, the carrier of Vril. He was the king of Mata Kitarani, the Manu of the Age of Tara, the husband of the goddess Tara. He saw her coming towards him, climbing down from the crater at the top of the volcano. She was wearing a red cloak woven from the thin bark of the three trees in the crater. She brought him an axe. It is the axe of Wotan. Its name is Toki. You are the Toki Manu. She was also carrying a flute and a heart with wings of Toromira wood. Keep this heart safe. We will have need of it. She played the flute and they both danced in a circle round each of the Manu Mohai. They were dancing like the Ras Lila. A clanking noise, like the sound of chains being dragged along, began to make itself heard, coming from the volcano. Quickly, it turned into a thunderous roar. The eruption followed almost immediately. Flames and lava shot upwards and rushed down the slope. The man-bird put his arm around his beloved's waist, and spreading his golden wings, flew off in the direction of the midday sun. She carried the dog in her arms. They saw how the Mohai collapsed, swaying on their bases. The island was covered with the fire of an emerging center. In the far distance, the whale was caught by the crew of El Cayuche. They stripped it of its skin, from which they made a golden fleece. Transformed into the skin of the lamb, it swayed in the wind, hanging from the branches of patriarchal oak trees. The Reunion with Jason On the shores of Lake Titicaca, the last of the Vikings were fighting a desperate battle against the tribes of Amazons from the south of Chile, the matriarchal forces of Queen Gaibomia, the ally of Kakike Kari of Coquimbo. The Temple of the Lake of the Sun of the Thousand Priests of Wotan had been partly destroyed by fire. This Viking civilization of Tiahuanacu, which had lasted for a number of centuries, was dying. It had been recreated by these white warriors who had come from the north in search of their ancestors, the Venusian giants, the white gods of the Morning Star. He was fighting alongside the defenders with the remainder of their decimated forces. It was all happening once again. In the past, the Aesir had had to abandon their sacred city of Asgard in the Caucasus near Mount Elbrus, the mountain of the goddess Freya of the smooth snow-white breasts. Attacked in exactly the same way by the Mongols, they had left the city. Led by Wotan, or Odin, they had set out once again on the exodus of defeat, this time in the direction of the right-handed swastika, the one that turns according to the present Earth's time and descends to the lowest depths of Kali Yuga. There, another golden age, or mirror image of the one that disappeared with the Hyperborean Thule, was lost. But the sorceress Aluin of the Odinic Order had prophesied that one day the descendants of the Aesir led by a great white chief, would reconquer Asgard, reversing the exodus and the movement of the right-handed swastika, returning to the nuptial homeland, going back up from city to city, from Asgard in the Caucasus to Shambhala and Agarti in the Himalayas, and from then to Ultima Thule in polar Hyperborea, so as to make the great leap to the morning star, to the ray of green light. The sorceress Vola had also prophesied this, asserting that the twilight of the gods would not last forever. It is very difficult to fight a woman who has become a demon, uncontrolled, externalized, left outside by the giants. 
The Amazons had consorted with the race of Earth people, with the semi-animals, with the robots of Lemuria and Atlantis. Their features were bestial. Their furious vengeance was directed against men as satanic hatreds, because in their heart of hearts they blamed them for all their misfortunes, for their dreadful fall. And perhaps they were right. And so, the white warriors, the last of the Vikings of America, were unable to find in themselves either the strength or the conviction to face such warlike fury as that exhibited by those demons of the South. It was the beginning of the end. The great Viking chief, Contisi Huiracocha, descendant of Namlap and of the White Gods, placed his last hope in the reinforcements which were said to be coming from the north. His armies retreated to the subterranean refuge of the gateway of Kalasasaya in the great temple of Tiahuanacu, which had been rebuilt and had been destroyed once more in the fighting. Shortly before the end, Huiracocha, who is also called Rama in this center, called together his closest followers, among whom he was numbered. Build a huge bonfire, he said. My world is that of fire, which fights against the satanic ice which comes from the farthest south, and also against the ice of the constellations. As soon as the fire began to crackle and blaze, the great chief leapt into it with his wife Mama Runtu, face white as an egg, who accompanied him, fulfilling the Hyperborean ritual of Sati. He continued talking from within the flames, addressing himself exclusively to him. None of this is real. It is Maya, illusion. I shall not die, because I will reach the green light through these flames. It is another who has sacrificed himself for me. I have passed through the secret door to the interior hollow earth, where I will wait for you to come to, when you have lost here, in order to come back to life there. Like Kontiki, like Kalki, at the appointed time at which we will bring back the Golden Age and rebuild Tiahuanaku, Asgard, and Mansagur, avenging the God of the Losers, the Morning Star, and our Lord and Prince Lucifer. Now you must take the name of Rama, reverse the direction of the swastika of the Exodus, reconquer Asgard, rebuild Tiahuanaku, enter the city of the Caesars, reach Ultima Thule, correct the balance of the axis of the earth. The great chief's dog, Eryx, constellation of flame, also leapt into the fire. However, it could see his and the woman's shadows go out the other side and enter the temple of Kalasasaya, as if they had been renewed in those flames of pure energy, in the bath of Tamasco. Sword in hand, he went out through the gateway of Kalasasaya. Entering the hall of Tiahuanaku, he climbed up until he reached the triangle where the sign of the right-handed swastika, the sign of the great exodus from Hyperborea, the sign of Rama, was hanging, and he reversed it turning it into a left-handed swastika, which turns backwards towards the point of origin. By doing so, he changed the course of the exodus, turning it into a return, a reconquest of all that had once been lost. He raised his sword and spoke thus to the warriors, soldiers of the solitary star, pilgrims of the south, guardians of the dawn, acolytes of Lucifer, of the glorious god of the flickering light, the great loser. We are going to reverse everything, change the course of the waters of destiny, going up to the South Pole and down to the North Pole. We are going to bring our guide back to life and avenge him. We will raise the continent of the spirit alongside the precarious coast of our native land. We will extinguish the volcanoes, halt the earthquake, we are going to win the War of the Mahabharata by losing all but the final, definitive battle. 
the one that is fought outside the earth, in the vast expanses of Father Ether, and even farther beyond, in the great void, in the disks of light. O warriors of the white gods, fight till the last drop of your blood is spilt, without ever retreating, without ever surrendering. Die fighting, because if you lose with honor, in reality you will have won, because you will have made the enemy visible. A defeat which leaves honor intact is a spiritual adventure which has been successful. Into battle, warriors of the Morning Star. They fought furiously all through that day and night. The next evening, he found himself surrounded by corpses, while the red of twilight dyed the waters of Lake Titicaca the color of blood. He scanned the lake. He thought he saw a vessel approaching. Perhaps these were the promised reinforcements. A high-kneeled boat slowly became visible in the dying light of the evening. From the branch of an oak tree from Dodona, nailed to the prow, hung the golden fleece. And there stood Jason, with his helmet and caress leaning on his great sword. He leapt ashore and pronounced the word Ram. O faithful comrade, you have arrived at the critical moment of the battle. So much time has passed. Get in quickly, Jason exclaimed. You will make your final stand in the ruins of the Temple of the Thousand Priests. He jumped into the boat, and they embraced. While the oarsmen rowed towards their objective with their backs turned, they were able to talk in the star-filled night. Medea also accompanied Jason, and she sang an ancient song which struck deep, distant chords in the hearts of the two friends. When my comrade loses heart, I laugh confidently. When my comrade sleeps, I watch for him. When my comrade falls, I fight for both of us, because to every warrior the gods have given a comrade. Watching the receding shore and the smoke from the fires, Jason reflected, they are the fierce Rangoons, the tribes who interbred with the monkey. All this was already foretold to us by the prophecy of the sorceress Vola. What happened to you, Jason? Where have you been for so long? In the intermediate kingdom of death. I have come to meet you here because it is the place of reunion appointed by destiny and the Norns. This is the Sangham, called Manipura, where the three rivers of death meet to reverse their flow and arrive at another, higher reunion, becoming the causal waters of life and resurrection. We are in the land of the Lamb, of the great guide Rama, of the Golden Fleece. One can only reach here by carrying a branch from the golden oak trees of Dodona, which is really Lamea. Ah, if you only knew with what nostalgia, what pain, I have always thought of you. After you left, I fought for the two of us, because if I were to arrive to triumph, you would do so in me. I carried your corpse across my shoulders, in the imperishable depths of my heart. I would not come back to life or enter Valhalla without you, because the gods made me your comrade. Jason gazed deep into the starry sky, listening as though he was not alive, as though he was not dead. They climbed down onto the quayside, which formed the terraces of the temple. Opus and Arge, the two Hyperborean priestesses, joined Medea and accompanied her in singing hymns composed by the Lycian bard Olen. Jason, don't go yet. I want you to meet my beloved. She's sleeping. Is her name Dania? asked Jason. Her name here is Mama Runtu, and it is also Sita, although recently I have been calling her Halloween. Her name was really Irene, as yours was Hector. Jason smiled gently. Let us go. In an underground chamber of the temple in the world of the jewels, as if surrounded by a sea of nectar, she lay sleeping. The comrades stood on each side of the head of the bed, 
leaning on their lances. Enraptured, they contemplated her. Her golden hair hung down almost to the floor. The dog, which had escaped from the flames, lay down at the foot of the bed. Hum, he intoned, and the echo of the mantra in the depths of the jeweled chamber was like the buzzing of a hive full of a thousand bees maddened by love. It is also a grave. The two comrades walked through the darkness until they reached a wilderness area. They lit a bonfire, and with the help of its light, they discovered a red triangle. It was a tombstone. Carved in the top corner was the left-handed swastika. In the center appeared a flower with ten petals, and in each of these vibrated a root letter. Da, da, na, ta, da, 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 ra, pa, pa. From Jason's attitude, the sadness in his voice, the way he looked at him, he foresaw that the moment of parting was near. A great wave of sorrow overwhelmed him, weighing heavily on his solar plexus. Jason said, Only you are with me in this critical moment. Medea has deserted me. Or rather, perhaps I was not loyal to her. I will try and recover her in the eternal return, in the vast expanses of the stars. Why, Jason, are we here, in this America of Tiahuanacu, speaking of Jason and Medea, Rama and Sita, and fighting the war of the Mahabharata? What do these Andean mountains have to do with all this? You are asking me a question to which you well know the answer. In the universe, there is only one history, one civilization, one war, that of the white gods. All the rest is merely the involution of their golden age. You and I are involutions of the white gods, Quetzalcoro and Kon Tisi Huiracocha were white gods, like Wotan, Orpheus, Apollo, Siva, Abraxas, Thor, and Lucifer. The others, the men of diminished stature who now inhabit the martyrized surface of the earth, are the surviving slaves of Atlantis and Lemuria, the men robots, the men ants, and animal men who caused the cataclysm and who will bring about its repetition through their rebelliousness and their ignorant pride. Jason opened the tomb. Before entering it, he turned to his comrade and stretched out his arm, palm upwards and fingers together, and made the Vara Mudra, which destroys fear, and he again pronounced the mantra, Ram. When the tomb had closed, he rotated the left-handed swastika, and everything was consumed by the fire. These ancient ashes. Death and Resurrection in Titicaca For many days, the warriors read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, presided over by Vilak Umu, the high priest of Inti, the sun, and by the Hyperborean trinity, Olin Tonatu. Gathered in the temple, they recited it to the wandering spirit of Jason, in the hope that he might find the road of the gods, overtaking the road of the fathers and avoiding the path of the moon. Sitting in the jewel chamber, he recounted to Aloine the last moments of his friend Jason, telling her about the nights during their youth when they have revealed to each other their dreams of adventure and heroic conquest in unexplored remote lands. Yes, Aloine, because to each warrior the gods have given a comrade, and to each poet pilgrim a beloved. You will never desert me. Without you, I could not endure the poverty of the exodus, nor the tests of the return to the nuptial homeland. I can foresee our separation, beloved. My lungs are not made for these heights of Tiahuanacu. The atmosphere here is rarefied. It was the puma which caused me to have this cataleptic fainting fit from which you awoke me. Just think, together we have crossed ages, immeasurable distances, light years, from the city of the elephant to these plateaus 
on which burns the fire of the intermediate regions. Those that lie between the earth, water, and air of the high peaks, I must bathe in the energy of this fire, becoming rejuvenated in its flames, so as not to disappear too soon, so that I can continue to climb a little higher at your side until I can see those silent peaks where the fiery lily of our eternal love blooms. In my imagination, I can already see these vast distances, these delicate, subtle spaces where the deer roams, escaping from us by leaping to safety in the forests of the air, dreaming of the wings of Father Ether. You must climb ever higher, beloved, with me alone in your heart, in your memory, and we will meet again, perhaps in the pure kingdom of cosmic poetry. There you will bring me back to life, because the poems exist, they await us. I feel something strange too, as if in the rarefied atmosphere of these high plateaus, scorched by the fires of passion and war, where the bridges of reunion and meeting lie, and the invisible subterranean rivers meet, feeding this Andean lake, an enlarging of my consciousness, which is no longer mine, was about to take place. As if my ego was about to be immersed in the divine, and my consciousness to be submerged in the unconscious, a process from which both would benefit, a transmutation. The virgins of the sun approached them, walking rhythmically from the ruins of the temple. They were accompanied by a melancholy music, with mineral resonances, a melody of the high plateaus of Titicaca. They had come in search of Aloween to take her to the bath of fire, in which she would be renewed. A ship full of soldiers was also approaching the lake. He had to go aboard it to lead those who were still fighting. When they were nearly in the middle of the lake, they were attacked by the enemy's boats, which fired flaming arrows at them. Suddenly, his vessel sank and the entire crew drowned. He tried to stay afloat by swimming, but the weight of his armor dragged him down. He felt himself drowning. The sensation was not frightening. Finally, a force more powerful than his conscious ego asserted itself the causal waters of death, and his ego accepted this with the acute intuition that it could do no more. However, he struggled until the end. He resisted, but serenely, almost joyfully, as if he had been freed from a responsibility which was too great for him. And it was like a carousel, a spinning world, a sky, a mirror turning back to front until it can be looked into from the other side. Afterwards, he went up and up until he reached the other side of that sky and that mirror. He found himself lying on the shore. He looked at himself in the transparent water and found himself changed. Although he still had the same body and his armor and his golden sword, his head was that of a ram, which was also like that of a dog and that of a jackal. He was Anubis, Osiris, Rama. He had come back to life. He was the one who had escaped from the waters, the twice-born, baptized in Lake Titicaca, emerging as half-man, half-god, reintegrated into an archetype. He went towards the ruins of the temple in search of his wife, Isis, she who had been reborn in the fire. The Burning Bush it was a golden dawn. The peaks of the Andes were transfigured in its light. The pillars of the temple were still standing. Within each pillar stands an angel. They looked like trees climbing up towards the peaks. With measured tread, he entered the triangular room in which she was being bathed in the fire of the energy of this center. The fire had been lit from the ashes left by those who had passed this way before them. Aloween emerged from the flames, rejuvenated. Within this fire was the world of the jewel of the carbuncle which had fallen from the broken crown of Lucy Bell 
destroyed in his stellar battle. The virgins of the sun recited, War is the father of all things. This is the meeting place of the fire from below and the celestial light. Here, the three-dimensional space begins to feel itself to be the prolongation of the fourth sphere. This is the Sangam of the three roads, the rock of revelation of midday, where the direction of the exodus changes, becoming the return to the non-created light, where the right-handed swastika becomes the left-handed one. And you can dream a dream that no one has ever dreamed before. The way out of the eternal return, the conquest of all the turns of the wheel. In this diaphragm, also called the totality of the jewel, you acquire a new name because you begin to receive an immortal soul which you had not possessed up until now. Naked, they were placed on a pedestal between ruined pillars. They were covered with ashes. He made the Varamudra with the palm of his hand upturned and his fingers together. Arga, the virgin of Apollo, came to his side. Your name was Rama. Today you are Osiris, the reborn, but your name is Rudra. You must destroy the Kali Yuga. Far off in the distance, I can hear the hoofbeats of the white horse of Kalki galloping towards the past, climbing back up the light. With him, you will get back to the figure of your beloved in order to clothe it with immortal substance. I can also hear the velvety, soft sound of the tiny hooves of the young fawn, which was once the lamb, which was formerly the elephant, and which may, if your bravery doesn't fail, become the dove. Opus, the second virgin of the sun, came and stood beside Aloine. Your name is Lakini, the wife of Rudra. You have been his loyal companion on the difficult pilgrimage to this center. O beloved Lakini, may our thoughts and tears follow you always on the sacrificial path of a moor, which you and your lover have so courageously chosen. Someone then brought in the dog, dragging it along by a chain. It was going to be sacrificed in the burning bush in the center of the triangle, as a propitiatory rite and food for the wedding. Lakini said, Not the dog. You must enter heaven with it, so there will be a dog from the city of Astinapura in the sky. If this were not so, how will you be able to recognize me when you travel towards the past, towards the constellation of the great dog? There I won't have a face, because I will have given it to your soul. Only the dog will recognize me by my essential perfume in the uncreated light, and it will lie down at my feet. Feeling himself to be filled with a divine substance, he knew that he could make the sign that would exchange the dog for a llama. And so the dog was saved, and the sacrificial llama, or lamb, was consumed by the fire. Its soft moaning would announce a new age, its rosy skin, the golden fleece, its aromatic flesh, the food of eternal amor. The virgins of the sun drew diaphanous veils in front of them, hiding them from view, because the Mysterium Conjunctionis was being fulfilled. Death in Anahata The young fawn. She had returned before me from the great journey. She was watching me with her evanescent, otherworldly expression stretched out before her window. Her breathing was difficult, unrhythmic, as if the puna, the atmosphere of rarefied fire of the stifling plateaus of the diaphragm, was still affecting her. She was holding a small book of poems by a Hindu author. In her musical voice, she began to read in English, Beloved warrior, my bonds are cut, my debts paid, my door has opened. I go everywhere. They crouch in their corner and weave their web of pale hours. They count their coins sitting in the dust 
and call me back. But my sword is forged, my armor is put on, my horse is eager to run. I shall win my kingdom. The English language is mysterious. The secret of our dog is to be found in it. Dog, spelt backwards, is God. The dog, then, is the road which, if traveled backwards, from the deepest depths, from the roots of the tree of smell, touch, and taste, will turn you into a god. Thus, the dog is the guide of the blind traveler, of the pilgrim of immortality. It is God backwards. In the garden of this house grew anemones, the most beautiful roses, camellias, and tall lilies. This spring, the cottonwood tree lit the flames of its red flowers, and the magnolias opened in response to the tender caresses of the moonlit nights. Some evenings, we would walk along a path in the garden, bordered by lilies, which raised their slender spikes as we passed. We almost always walked in silence, pensively, remembering our adventures, transmitting them to one another by a thought, a look, or an expressive movement of our heads. At times, by a delicate touch of our hands, very gently, as if we were afraid of hurting each other. One day, the Lord was walking along the narrow alleyways of a city. People recognized him and began to gather round him. He was going to heal a sick child. But suddenly, he stopped and said, Who has touched my cloak and taken away my power to cure? Do you know, said Aloine, once I had a most beautiful dream, a waking dream. I saw myself as a little girl once more at the feet of the Lord, leaning against his cloak. And such was my joy and the feelings of security, of protection, that I didn't want ever to return to this world again. In that Santiago spring, her dreams, her visions, were a foretaste of the worlds which she would never be able to reach while she was alive. The final years of the Great War were drawing to a close, continually expanding within the dreadful confines of the recurrent archetype. One day, something we had long expected took place. From one of the nearby allotments, or from the street, we never knew which, a young fawn leapt over our garden fence. And I say something we had long expected, because although it took us by surprise, it filled us with an inexpressible, predetermined joy. We stood and looked at it. It did the same. Because we were of the race of Avalon, we could understand the language of the animals. We realized that it was asking us to give it sanctuary in our home. We took it inside and fed it with magnolia leaves that grew from Halloween's fingers, honey from her lips, and iridescent feathers from her breast. We called it Sita in memory of the wife of Rama, he who had been lost light years ago, sacrificed on the high plateaus of the diaphragm. And suddenly we realized that we were no longer alone in our house. An incredible being had slipped in, like a thief in the night, stealing all we possessed, something we couldn't control, as timid as a nightingale, as tremulous, but at the same time as ungovernable as the wind. With enormous eyes veiled by the vapor of its imponderable world, it watched us for a few moments, then immediately leapt through the window into the garden as if it already had wings. And it was as if all this, which was taking place outside us, was being copied inside us. A being from another world, an alien consciousness, also began to stir there as if jumping uncontrollably from time to time, as if it wanted to fly by itself but didn't as yet have wings. We came up against the boundaries of an air which was quivering the heart of a gentle breeze, as if the flower of the heart was beginning to open and to give us a hint of the perfume exuded by its petals. 
But air was no longer entering Aloween's lungs. She was having difficulty breathing. She was very ill. In those final years of the Great War, the cure for her illness had still not yet been discovered. She insisted that a Hyperborean priestess, a virgin of the sun, of the Odinic order, could die at will at the appointed time. This power was called Ikam Tu, and the Lord of Voluntary Death was Mati Myaya. The sign of disillusion was Samhara Mudra. The female guru could make it. It was during one of our last walks in the garden that one midday we found a marvelous flower with twelve petals. Aloween took it to her room and looked at it for a long time. Then she took her brushes and painted the flower. On each petal she drew a letter. Ka, ka, ga, ga, na, ka, ka, ja, ja, na, ta, ta. And round the flower she drew two interlocking triangles. This is the non-existent flower, so that it may really exist the kingdom of the non-existent, which is more real than all that exists, we must say, Yam. This is the sound which will give life to this flower. Yam, we cried together. And the non-existent flower of the heart opened up for us, enveloping her house, the garden, the city of Santiago del Nuevo, Extremo, the last years of the Great War, are then current a more in the slightly troubling magical scent of all that doesn't exist, of all that has never existed, of all that will never exist. At that same moment, the fawn escaped from the house. Fearing that it might be knocked down by the traffic, I ran into the street after it. I followed it for hours. Sometimes it vanished into the distance, but it would always stop to look at me with its smoky eyes whenever it thought that I wouldn't be able to find it again. And in this way, we reached the abode of God, one of the two hills outside our city. The fawn began to climb it with great leaps which were sometimes almost twelve petals high. With great difficulty, I followed it. In the pine forests at the top of the hill, we stopped to gaze at the dusk falling over Santiago. Veils of purple spread over the city until they enveloped the high snow-covered peaks of the Andes. Our evening star appeared. The fawn, which had now become a black antelope called Turuka, raised one of its hooves and pointed out the peaks of my homeland to me. There, there, Will I wait for you, like Condor, like Paloma? Yam, I replied, and it vanished from my sight. I bent down and picked up a dried flower, like the coagulated blood of twilight. A fruit for Halloween, I thought, and I returned to the dark streets, filled with a presentiment, or rather a memory, a premonition of something that had already happened many times and was now about to be repeated. I was convinced that Halloween was dying once more. I know that my story may seem too strange and allegorical. However, I would not be able to relate it in any other way, as this is the only form in which I can understand anything in it, inventing a meaning for it, so as to dream my life better through it consoling myself for so many misfortunes, coming one after the other in my existence and in those of the defeated warriors, the pilgrims of the dawn. Perhaps none of it is anything more than pure fantasy, I tell myself from time to time, and I am only the glorious victim of my own mental creations. So what I have called my non-existent flower might be just another illusion. And behind it, all is nothingness, only nothingness. I shiver in the icy polar wind, especially in the moments of death of this woman, whom I have loved more than anything in this life, beyond everything, 
beyond everything, O oh gods. How could her superhuman courage, in face of the end which she could see approaching, be explained unless it was that she believed, like me, that she was possessed by the archetype of eternal love, which transcends the limitations of this life? More even than I, who found myself crushed by the enormous, brutal realization of her approaching end, she enveloped her final hours in allegories and symbols. I found her lying on her bed, motionless, with her face, neck, and hands partly covered in blood. I leaned over her, but she signals that I was not to touch her. I ran to fetch a towel and a basin of water. Very gently, I began to wash her hands and neck. When I came to her face, I kissed her lips and drank her blood. Her eyes stared fixedly into the depths of my soul and told me everything. For a minute, she became afraid of the inevitable, or perhaps my kiss had weakened her in her struggle, shaking her titanic resistance. I clasped her hands between mine and softly began to recite her poem to her. The tenuous melancholy spins its delicate web in the soul, and the muffled murmur of memories darkens space. The renewed certainty of eternal development rises out of infinity and slowly impregnates each thread of frozen mist. All is death, conclusion, end. The leaves fall, resigned, pained by their immense fragility. Twisted by the strident clamor of the being which struggles to escape the inevitable, the soul turns and turns within the black space, conceiving a vague desire for self. The spark creates, the warm flame grows and grows, crackling and magical. The mists disperse in its heat. In the silence of the white peaks blooms the fiery lily of eternal love. In a weak voice and with a slight smile playing on her lips, she explained to me, this is Meister Eckhart's tiny spark. Ah, how can I make it crackle inside my soul again? I love you more than anything in this world and all the others, and if the gods choose, I shall but love thee better after death. I give you my eternity. You alone can bring me back to life, because you alone know my real name. And I say to you again that you will have no other companion in this life or in the gloomy depths of the grave, because I opened up your heart as though with a knife, and I entered it and will live there for all your eternity. I shall breathe with your breath, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and try to think with your brain. I shall love with your soul and your body. My beloved, you will be my coffin of perfumed, precious wood. Don't forget that resurrection belongs to the realm of magic, of what may or may not be. To our non-existent flower, I shall live for as long as you live, and so you must not die. For you, I shall make myself immortal. For you, I shall not die. As long as my ego exists, and it will always exist, you will be in it. For by your death, you have triumphed over life. You have ensured that I will love you above all else and carry you in my blood, my cells, my bones, and my breath, raising your throne in my heart. I must not die so that you will not die. With a great effort, she got out of bed and fetched a winged heart made from Toromira wood and a small bag of golden brocade. She placed the heart on her breast, on top of her nightgown, and drew me down on top of her, so that we had only one heart between us. A winged heart, which might possibly enable us to fly to the silent white peaks where the fiery lilies of eternal love bloom. Then she gave me the small bag, which has never left me since. Inside it are tiny things, a silk handkerchief 
stained with her blood. A silver laurel leaf won in the last great war by a warrior troubadour. And a topaz, her birthstone, in this turn of the wheel. For the last time, she referred to the legend which we had dreamed of living. Santiago is enveloped in mist, in the gray fog of hope, anxiety, and repentance. It is so similar to life because it always seems as if something is about to happen. This city is a beating heart. You will always find my grave here. Help me. I can't breathe anymore. I took her into my arms and placing my mouth over hers, I began to breathe for her, inside her, until I felt faint. Then she threw her arms round my neck, and with her last ounce of strength, she caressed me and kissed me. I shall never forget the way in which she looked into the depths of my soul, my being, for the last time, questioning me with her last remaining forces, which were fading away, vanishing, where? Where? And she begged, Lord, help me. In a corner of the room, a sound made as if two things were rubbing together could be heard, as if someone had entered or gone out. And she lay still, like a flame in a place without wind. The land of tears is so mysterious. Clutching her body, which was growing colder and colder, I sobbed. Don't go away again. Don't leave me here alone. We still have so much further to go. Years, centuries, until we reach the city of dawn, our morning star, the nuptial homeland. Once again, I have been unable to hold on to you, saving you from the terrifying waters of death, fighting to prevent the shadows from swallowing you up in the eternal, everlasting return. I covered her body with kisses, trying to stop the spread of the cold of death. Thus I found myself one day, wrapped in her golden hair, holding her stiff hands, continually putting my mouth to hers in a constant effort to breathe for her. My tears ran down her dead cheeks. I dressed her as a bride and carried her body to an agate bench in the enchanted garden. I dug a grave and buried her. On the gravestone, I carved the symbol of the left-handed swastika, of the road of return, along which I would now have to travel alone, in the hope of being reunited with her one day, in the vast ice fields of the deep south and of death. Attempting to force that gate which refuses to open. Standing beside her grave, I made the sign that destroys fear and read these lines. I must travel to a country you never saw, although it was as closely akin to you as one half of your senses. Yes, I must travel, because to every warrior the gods have given a comrade who will continue fighting for both when one has already gone. And on the same stone I carved the following. Nowhere, beloved, can world exist but within. Hope till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. A dead flower is not the corpse of a flower. And thus the grave of my beloved has remained in the springtime of my native land in the city of my heart forever. The master speaks about what follows. Dejection. Once again, I am in the presence of the master. I look at him with vacant eyes, as if caught between two worlds, a little like she used to do. Lacking the strength to continue my journey, I have stopped at this point the master doesn't speak the commonplace words of sympathy, he doesn't feel pity, because this feeling doesn't exist between us. Either I am able to overcome the pain of my wounds, or I have to stop my journey. You now have 49 days in which to help her. 
There are those who obtain liberation at the moment of death, when the spirit leaves the body, and those who die in ignorance, returning to this life in other turns of the wheel, without personal memory, as a flame lights other flames. The two paths beyond the grave are the path of the fathers, of those who return, and that of the gods. In the moment of death, one has the presentiment of a great light, the midnight sun of the ancients. Then follows the diminution of this light and the indecision of the choice of paths, the dejection particular to a change of state when the dead person is swallowed up by the wail of death. Of course, whoever has followed a discipline of initiation in this life will be in a position to overcome this great crisis of dejection and arrest the slow process of decomposition. The ego is really a reflection of an eternal form of the name written in the Book of the Stars. When consciousness disappears, the ego dissolves in the waters of death in a prolonged dream. In death, only the one who has become alive, who has managed to wake up, takes this eternal form, his real name, and gives it a face, the face of his soul, which is the face of his beloved. He can do this because in life he was able to install a goddess in every secret corner of his beloved's body, in the magic rite of loveless amour in the absolute idealization of the woman. The Transcendent Light The transcendent light that the dead man perceives at the moment of complete disconnection, when the silver string of this life is cut, the umbilical cord which joins him to Mother Earth, lasts three or four days. This is when the being finds itself in a state of great dejection. The term day is a symbolic expression, since this state can continue during many terrestrial ages. After an early darkness, which at first may seem definitive because of the disappearance of terrestrial consciousness, as if one had entered a black hole, the mind awakens to a state of supernatural lucidity. It finds itself in the absolute, uncreated light, listening to the primordial sound, its note, its real name, written in the stars, like a violent light, like a thousand thunders. There is a disc which also comes to carry him away, assuming that he has been able to ask the question. This is the great test within the bosom of death, as if it had been outside in life. The ego who survives will have to be able to identify with this light, conquering every doubt, recognizing himself in it, because metaphysically they are the same. And it will be like a reunion with an old friend who had been waiting for him beside a spring. On the other side of the mirror. It seems that in death the chakras are externalized, so to speak, becoming visible for the dead man, expressing themselves in concrete form like the astrological heavens with their houses of the zodiac. Different heavens with angels and emblematic animals with the people of dreams of the Orphic heavens. To die is like going to look at one's body from outside, the cosmogonic body of cosmic man, because heaven has the shape of a man said Swedenborg. The shape of his chakras, each chakra being a heaven and a hell, with its nectar and its poison. In this way, whoever has achieved the efficacy of his chakras in life does not follow the difficult path in death. To die is like passing to the other side of a mirror, into an upside-down sky, like falling out of one's skin into the soul. Whoever has experienced mystic death during his life is already the lord of the two worlds. The great crisis of consciousness, dejection, 
there as here, is produced in the Anahata Chakra, the chakra of the air and the heart, and in the Vishuddha Chakra, the chakra of the ether and the throat. Hesitation, doubt as to whether to continue along the path. A woman has no soul. She is the soul. The master pauses. Life and death are two opposite faces of the same coin beyond which rational consciousness is unable to go. They are different states of being, the obverse and reverse of a mirror, the exterior and interior surface of a star. The secret path of yoga along which you are traveling is only for the warrior, for the initiated hero. It is not a path for a woman, because a woman has no chakras, no kundalini to awaken. Because a woman is the world of the chakras through which the hero must travel. A woman is kundalini. A woman has no soul. She is the soul. A woman has no eternity. She is eternity. The grave mistake of the externalized woman, of the Eve who is left outside by the giants and who enters into competition with man, of the Valkyrie who has become an Amazon, imposing her feminine power, her matriarchy, is to attempt to follow a form of yoga when she herself is a form of yoga. The authentic, absolute woman sacrifices herself voluntarily, immolating herself in order to give her eternity to her lover in the anxious yet serene hope that he will bring her back to life. The woman's road is that of magic eternal love. She hands her lover the chalice of the grail, filled to the brim with the liquor of immortality. Once the symbolic possession has been accomplished, the mysterium conjunctionis, it must never again be repeated. She dies externally, and he maintains the sacred chastity of the Knights of the Grail. Because chastity is a fortune which stems from an abundance of love. The treasure must be guarded. The energy of Rill must be preserved. It's without death element. It's a moor, which descends from Mount Maru, from Siva's forehead, from the summit of your own head, like the invisible river Saraswati which doesn't exist, flowing down from the head of Siva, crowned with the waning moon, in deepest midnight, from the ancient sun, from the morning star. The course of the river must be reversed in order to end the involution of the Kali Yuga, the turns of the wheel, the generations of death. Just as a non-generated fire exists behind a visible fire, an eternal, constant, permanent, endless pleasure also exists behind fleeting physical pleasure. A non-engendered pleasure, a divine, ecstatic, voluptuousness, a transcendent orgasm, without beginning or end. Its apogee is the state of endless exaltation that replaces all fleeting sensations of potency. Ecstatic orgasm is an effulgence which breaks through the bounds of finite consciousness and bestows absolute personality, the separate, permanent ecstasy of the tantric hero, because he has detached himself from his physical conditionality. The god of desire, Smara, has been destroyed by the ray of light projected from the third eye by Vril. This is the supreme delight of non-engendered pleasure. Pleasure of unthought thoughts of the beloved flowing permanently through the river of nectar of unremembered memory, beyond forgetfulness and memory, a memory which is not connected to the brain. The beloved is now the hidden beloved, she who has died and buried herself in your bones and in your veins. The female Sophia, guru of the soul, she who courses through the blood, the female philosopher, Sophia, wisdom, the dove, gnosis, the woman who gives this magic possibility of amor to the initiated warrior 
is a Hyperborean priestess, a virgin of the sun of Tiahuanaku. She is Aloween, the virgin of the grail, who heroically puts her eternity at risk in order to give her lover immortality and the possibility of resurrection. She is the priestess of eternal love. Don't stay in Anahata. In spite of your immense pain and sadness, don't stay in this city where she died. Overcome your feelings. Continue the journey of immortality. She now lives in your unthought thoughts, expanding your consciousness, helping you overcome the ego. Because whenever you look at yourself in the clear waters of her pool and discover that half of your face is her face, you won't say I, but Nas, we. We can only speak of all this figuratively. How else could we speak of it? The hallucinatory descriptions given by the ancients exceed even our most fantastic imaginings. Who else but those who had managed to immerse themselves in cosmic poetry could give us those descriptions and paintings of beings with many heads and arms, of gods with elephants' bodies? And however incredible it may seem to us, the reality surpasses all that the imagery, metaphor, or painting can reproduce. It is useless to try and represent in it words. It just isn't possible. Immersed in that cosmic poetry, you must continue your march to the end, from city to city, from flower to flower. Even if you abandon the struggle, at the point you have now reached, if you wish to stop, you have incurred punishment from heaven and hell because of your attempt. In the Great War, there is no room for the faint-hearted, the cowardly. A criminal or an anarchist will be better conditioned than an indecisive or cowardly man. They only need a push in the right direction. Only one who is born a hero or a warrior has a place in our order. Only the Lord of Pure Will can march to the end, breaking in the gates of the City of Eternal Life. Because will, through its perseverance, creates the thing it contemplates. Only the wild hordes of Odin and Parsifal will achieve the Grail. He who entered the city had to clothe his immaterial body with the immortal energy of Vajra, he possesses a body which will survive even in ultimate disillusion. He has come back to life without leaving a dead body in his grave, exchanging his corpse for a sword, as in the yoga of the ancient China of the giants, who made themselves immortal with a Chekai body. The Hyperborean Dropas of Tibet did so with Jalus, rainbow body, the Egyptians called this ability to maintain oneself erect in death, Sahu. The magicians of Tierra del Fuego called it Huayuhuen, their incorruptible body. The Siddha magicians called it Siddha Rupa, made up of other elements, like the glorious body of the Gnostics. Thus, immortality is conditional. It isn't for everyone. It must be gained through merciless combat at every hour of every day of your life. It must be invented, recreated, without the assistance of any god, against God, against all the gods and men, in the opposite direction to the current of the river of the age of Kali Yuga. The places have almost been filled, the places of those who will be immortalized, passing to the other age, to the land of resurrection, the hand of the sower scatters many seeds, but only a few bear fruit, and they are sufficient to make bread. The earth will be left fallow for an eternity. It is related that Buddha also conquered the temptation of Nirvana thanks to a female guru, a Hyperborean sorceress yogini. Buddha was of the warrior caste, and so he could transform the nirvanic I am her into Hamza, 
him and her separated and united forever, belonging to an immortal, resurrected race, without God, all the gods, without a king, free. But this is not spoken of in the Kali Yuga. How can I bring her back to life? She is waiting for you somewhere in the universe. She is your woman, destined for you since the beginning of time, singled out in an Akashic cosmic register. She never had children of the flesh, and so she never lost her magic virginity. You are her child. She conceived you spiritually, and before she left, she made you pregnant with eternity. You must give birth to it shortly, at the end of your pregnancy with the son of mystic death. Only loving like a pure madman can you continue along the road. But how many times do you believe you love someone and in reality you love no one, not even yourself? When I refer to the resurrection of your beloved, don't imagine that this is only an allegory, a symbolic legend. What is within is without, what is above is below, it has been said. The secret enchanted cities also exist, hidden in the earth. The disks of light may come and rescue you before the catastrophe, if you have called on them correctly. The road is synchronistic in both directions and in various spaces. When you wake up internal centers of superior consciousness, you transfigure the landscape of the exterior earth. Your beloved can also be brought back to life with the same body, but immortalized. You may think, why this body, this earthly form? Because it is the only one, cosmically speaking. The sky has the shape of a man's body, and the shape of the man is the reproduction of the shape of the sky, as in the interplay of an infinite number of mirrors from the largest, the macrocosm, to the smallest, the particle, the atomic gods. Master, how can I bring her back to life? With the living word, with the cosmic language of the inaudible mantras in which sounds are expressed by the direct vision of the substance of things, the voice itself of things, a voice which cannot be heard by any material ears. Akasha, the ether, is the substratum of this phenomenon and of every act of one's life. The substance of Akasha is the inaudible sound, the word, the logos, which has shut itself off from ordinary man through dreams and fantasy. But he who has entered the city of the inaudible word reads in nature as if in a book written in a language full of meaning, a language that he knows and understands. On this level, the word is the living word, energy, a command word for physical and non-physical reality. Material vibrations are the resonance of other more essential vibrations, which in their turn depend on meaning, the Tao of China. The word of command given by the one who attains this supreme plane of synchronistic meaning, this lucky occurrence filled with meaning will be like a ray of light or a flash of lightning which, starting from a correct height, passes through hierarchies until it imposes itself on the very vibration that determines and coheres matter. It is the magic voice of command, the ray of light, the living word. In the beginning was the word, so it was said, and in the end also. With this legendary Hyperborean knowledge, the White Gods built Tiahuanaku, the Mohai of Easter Island, Stonehenge, the faces imprisoned in the planet's mountains and the non-natural islands and continents, and controlled the course of the stars at will. It is also by means of inaudible sound, Orphic music, that the Vimanas rise into the air. The force of gravity is overcome, and the appearance and disappearance of the disks of light that know the thoughts and feelings of men is directed. The Lord of the Names 
The living word acts on the internal cosmic centers which produce the external, visible, physical form and can also materialize the astral body, disintegrating and reintegrating it at will. Our order has a special right for this, with its signs and its mantra. In this way, one comes back to life with a body of Vajra, of incorruptible red matter, as hard as diamond, the adamantine body. The living word has various dimensions in relation to power and the will to power. The spoken word stands at the very bottom of the involuted scale, being the faint echo of the inaudible word. All beings, from the gods to mankind, possess a sound, an essential name, a key note. By discovering what it is, one acquires the power to decompose and recreate it. It is also a mantra of voluntary death and resurrection. In current parlance, the individual chromosomatic genetic code has been deciphered. The secret has been penetrated. The name to which we refer corresponds to the supratemporal being and has nothing to do with the intimate family name, although sometimes a delicate synchronicity is produced within a turn of the wheel, a mysterious lucky occurrence filled with meaning, and this name may also be symbolic. You must discover your beloved's real name if you are to bring her back to life, and yours too. They are the names of the god and goddess to whom they will give a face, of the god within you. As the Hindu greeting says, Namaste, I greet the god within you. The essential name cannot be chosen. It isn't arbitrary. It is filled with the meaning of the root note. It is a mantra, an eternal designation. It is inscribed in the book of the stars, on the tree of life, awaiting its actualization. The initiate of our order is given his real name when he has successfully undergone the most difficult tests. Then it is inscribed in the genealogical tree of the family in the immortal circle of the Hyperborean initiation. If I were to call you by your real name now, you wouldn't hear me. I have called you by it a number of times, and you didn't hear me, even in your dreams. He who knows someone's real name gains control over that person's life and death. When you know your real name, don't reveal it to anyone but your comrade and your beloved. I will give you mine so that you can call me when I have left, but you must only use it if you find yourself in mortal danger, concentrating on achieving the correct intonation. I will always come. When you possess this power, you will be the lord of the names, master of the scepter of the adamantine voice. The elemental spirits, the gods and the demons will be your servants. The gods must obey those who know their names. He who only speaks audibly with his larynx evokes phantom sounds and ghosts, echoes of real names, because the primordial power has been lost. He speaks and speaks, writes and writes, without the word, without power, without magic, only with the larynx, only with the hand of the dead who bury the dead. Never speak or write in this way. Sow your words and your writings in the deep, infinite powers of the pilgrims of longing, with the rhythmic sounds of a magic language behind which hide the essential letters of the little mothers inscribed in the scroll of the light of Akasha. But you must sing in code, always in cipher, and never reveal anything because it will be what you don't say more than what you have been able to say with such difficulty and singularity, which will one day inspire the souls of the young heroes who will come after you and will also fight the difficult battle, if there is still a world for them in a post-technological age. If anything is to remain after you, two are gone. The Seal of the Word the road of the mantra of the Hyperborean, Orphic Kabbalah, is also a left-handed road leading backwards.
towards the point of origin. Master, how can I bring her back to life? With the mantra that acts on the seed of the phenomenon, actualizing the subtle phenomenon of uncreated light behind the audible mantra, entering as if through an opening. First must come the hypnotic repetition of the mantra. Then its repetition must become a mere outline. And finally, it must occur only in the mind, becoming a purely spiritual act. The creative vibration acts upon the internal and external centers of the universe. If, in the meantime, you have managed to catch up with the actual form of your dead lover, which is traveling through the light close to the ether of Akasha, and have discovered her real name, you will be in a position to clothe her in the red mantle of resurrection and with the diamond of immortality. The signs of our order are the seal which is placed upon the word, the mantra, and the immortal flesh with which it is covered. Thus, the sign is also the word expressed through its creative vibration. It is the creation of the world by the gesture, the word concentrated in a formula. In this way, if the world and mankind were to be destroyed, the existence of the sign which represented them stored in the memory of the light would reproduce them eternally by means of its vibration alone, and the inaudible word would once again be evoked, and its explosion of green light. You have traveled from a long way down, a long way off, from the deepest depths, from flower to flower, from the garden of your childhood, to this cemetery of doves where your beloved lies. Father Ether. There followed a silence in which we looked at each other, trying to meet in that zone of the unspoken word, in the waves of its music. He stretched out his hands and touched my ring. The seal on your ring is the seal of resurrection. You are governed by it. In which part of the universe will you regain your beloved? Where? You alone can find it. You will find it by traveling towards the past, like those birds which meet in the middle of the ocean, having flown from opposite continents, in the sea of death, in the register of Father Ether. Then, by common accord, we mentally recited, No God, no man, raised me, even before my mother took me in her arms and her breasts nourished me, you lifted me tenderly, pouring sacred breath, divine beverage, into my nascent breast. O oh, Father, you nourish all things with your nectar. It is for this also that beings love you, and fight and incessantly struggle towards you in joyous growth. Divine ether, does not the plant seek you with its eyes. To meet you, the imprisoned seed breaks its coat, and the steps of the noble animals of the earth turn into flight. The hooves of the deer, as if in jest, skim over the grass, and like a zephyr it roams, scarcely visible in the thickets. But ether's favorites, they, the fortunate birds, live and play happily in the eternal porch of the Father. And my heart stricken with longing miraculously yearns to fly with them. A smiling homeland seems to call me from above, and I long to climb to the peak of the Alps, and there implore the eagle who is speeding by to carry me as in the past the arms of Zeus did the fortunate youth from this prison to the grandiose porch of Ether. O oh, Father Ether, through all the rains of the earth, the longing to live in your gardens drives us. O, oh, who can guide the wandering ship towards those golden shores? I direct my longing upwards, towards the darkening distance, where your blue waves girdle strange shores. Whispering, you descend towards me from the flowery top of the fruit tree, 
Father Ether, and you yourself calm my racing heart. And happy as of old, I again live close to the flowers of the earth. The Return to the Beginning of Life You will go back to live close to the flowers of your country, because if you make the great leap into the void, beyond the top of the fruit tree, you will fall once more into the garden of your childhood, which you will have regained. You will go back to the place in which you have never ceased to be, with the self-same body, and you will find yourself sitting once more at the window in the evening light of that city in which she died. And although everything may be the same as before, it will seem as if it is not the same. It will seem as if it is not the same. The Astral Tunnel It would seem that the energy, the will to power, has left a secret entrance for the apparent coincidences, where they create the roots of new coincidences and produce the acausal phenomena filled with meaning, beyond all the categories which are understandable to the darkest age, where the language made up of audible words places itself as a screen or a mask or a trap between the mind and reality. Because it is in a more and in the atom, in the atomic gods, that those things which do not exist occur. Once this point has been reached, any localized movement rocks the universe, and anything you do or fail to do will have repercussions throughout the whole of creation. That is to say, Kali Yuga must be defeated inside you. The Golden Age will first return in your soul. The mystery is unknown to the age of Kali Yuga because it is beyond the comprehension of animal men. When you mount the white horse of Kalki, moving faster than the speed of light, it will be the selective resonances which will carry you like they carry the birds to meet your dead lover in the ocean of light. You will see her coming towards you from the future which you have overtaken, and you will have to stop and wait for her. If you were able to get her back, traveling at such speed, she will be yours forever because you will have entered immobility and time, which is the speed of light, will never again waste or exhaust her. Then you will fill her with meaning, that speed greater than light. And in this way, you will discover that she has never been dead and has never been alive. And it will be you who will decide her resurrection and her return to light and time. All this is a more because none of it can be achieved unless you love like a pure madman. Our martial order encounters the same dangers and assistance in the cosmos as here on Earth. In the cosmos, there are huge invisible black holes, which may be the gateways to other universes that are totally different to the one in which we live, governed by diametrically opposed laws, an antimatter, a counter-initiation, an anti-energy, or without any laws at all. They might represent the way out of the circle of circles, of the eternal return of the same thing, of the recurrence of the turns of the wheel. They might also represent what has been called the demon, the nothingness, which was introduced into the world as an alien element. The impulse which led to the breaking of the egg of him-her, and her him, a chance destiny. Something has fallen in on itself, consuming its own light, turning into a black hole which alters everything and slowly sucks in and devours whatever approaches it and even what is far away from it. Entire galaxies become hypnotized by this invisible sightless eye that makes its presence felt through the events it creates and by which it is surrounded. If a body approaches it, it will be absorbed. However, its image will remain floating outside for a long time, and may therefore be mistaken for the real body until, moving ever more slowly, it reaches the horizon of events. 
There it will stay for some while, until it also disappears, without anyone ever being able to discover what happened to it, or to its real body. Light has no power to escape from this place. It disappears. The eternal recurrence of the light has come to an end. Will the same thing also happen to the mystic death of the ego, and to the darkness, which on the death of the body precedes the explosion of new uncreated light? Will it be the black sun, which extinguishes the golden sun, to give entry to the ray of green light? Will the Vamanas, the anti-gravitational disks of light, pass through here towards other parallel or diagonal universes? Perhaps the light, when it has gone through this astral tunnel, reappears afterwards in another universe, changed, transfigured. Is this light of our world the shadow of another, more real light? Must one let oneself go, sucked in by a black hole, in order to reach a state which is possible, although it has never been imagined before, even by the greatest dreamers of longing? Our order of warriors aspires to pass from this visible light of the golden sun, which is the shadow of the light of the black sun, to that indescribable state, that non-existence of the ray of green light, where our exalted guides dwell, and from there to return hand in hand with our beloved. But there is a time for everything on the second earth, and also in the plans of death. You will have to hurry to stop your beloved being lured to the horizon of events and swallowed up by a black hole in which you will never find her again, because she will have fallen into it without you. The Cathar Stars Who are these white stars? These supernovas, the remains of stars which, after committing suicide in the Endura, like a Cathar Parfait, have left their hearts beating in the firmament as signs to tell us that the great secret has been penetrated. Perhaps they might be able to help us. Perhaps we might come to understand them, because they are our friends. When they disappear, they leave in their place some tiny messengers, which are also white and which go on beating, pulsating, moving their other lights, as an aid to the pilgrim, like torches which light his way with their dreams. Because they were also warrior monks, troubadours, minasangar of cosmic space, who loved beyond life and death with eternal amor, they know the secret of how to achieve immortality through endurance and adamantine concentration and could give us the formula which would enable us to cross the horizon of the event without disintegrating and pass through the black holes as if they were an astral tunnel without losing our terrestrial light, becoming the envoys of this world and this light to the other light. Because resurrection and immortality must be achieved in our universe of visible light. Only with the incorruptible body of the white gods will you be able to go beyond the black sun without losing your image and that of your beloved, fulfilling the ultimate mystery as children and envoys of the terrestrial light to the universes which lie beyond. The magic officiant of resurrection, the carrier of Vajra, the mysterious initiator of the process on this side of things is Lucy Bell, the morning star, the star of your initiation and your homeland. Its light in this world is a premonition of the ray of green light. Listen to me carefully. Only within this cosmic poetry is there hope, because only poets who have searched in their hearts have been able to find the bond which connects what is and what is not. And perhaps they know things that the gods, in the highest of all heavens, don't know.
The Solitude of the Trialogue I Recover the Dog I accompanied the master to the end. No one else was with him at the moment of his departure. We were alone till the very end. And I have never seen him again. It was as if he had disappeared into the invisible world of the Black Sun. But I know that he will come if I ask him for help in the battle, if I call him by his real name. He will also be with me till the end. I traveled extensively all over the world. It was my pilgrimage in the exterior world, in a synchronistic way, I suppose. And I have written about this search, singing in code, as he advised. I will not repeat it. I went to both poles. I lived in India for many years. I climbed to the top of Mount Segur. I searched for the oasis of ice in the Antarctic, the entrance to the hollow earth, and the cities of Agarti and Shambhala in the Himalayas, and the cities of the Caesars, the giants, and the white gods in the Andes of my childhood. And one day, I found myself once again in my city of Santiago de la Nueva Extremadura, and I walked along the same streets, stopping in front of the window through which she had once looked at me, beside a garden in which her gravestone could still be seen. The grave watered by tears, O oh, you, fields of wheat. The dog had remained on this spot, without eating or sleeping, for all these years. It howled and howled, and it was its howling that made me come back. I caught hold of its lead and took it with me. As we walked away through the streets, towards the foothills of the Andes, I sang a song taught to me by my father, who had died long ago. There on the far horizon sings the lark. She is waiting for me, and I must return quickly. The dog looked deep into my eyes and accompanied my singing in a sweet voice. The House on the Mountain I built the house exactly as I had seen it in our waking dreams. I spent most of my time in the tower, reaching it by means of the secret passageway beside the fire. From that height, I had a dazzling view of the eternally snow-covered peaks, especially at dawn and at dusk, when they were dyed with the colors of longing, covered in a sea of red or purple and a mantle of liquid emerald. At daybreak, when the morning star appeared, I would meditate seated in my chair of Toromiro wood. I always held the sword called Blood Memory and wore a golden cape from the city of Udaipur. In this way, I was the guardian of the dawn, the pilgrim of the dawn. Every evening, I would meditate again, and there were times when I spent the whole day in this state, stretching a golden string between dawn and dusk so that time flew by and my midday became my midnight. And thus, I was also the guardian of the dew of the waters of the moon. One evening, the poet Holderlin visited me in my tower. He stood there outlined against the evening light, which washed away the color of the mountains drop by drop, and recited his elegy to Father Ether to me. We took leave of each other, saying, Hum, and with our hands extended, and our fingers together, I also said, Hail, because he was a Minnesonger, a Trabador bird, a son of Wovre Saelde, our beloved Isolde. I saw him go off in the direction of the pole and of the star of Lucifer, riding on a white elephant. The Bird of Paradise Another day, I was visited by the tiny blue bird, which used to sing at my beloved's window in the mornings of long ago, and it began to trill in a way which brought joy to my heart again. I greeted it, saying, Tiny bird, singing at my window, thank you, my tiny bird, for the beautiful morning. The bluebird stretched out its wings and opened its feathers as if it were a peacock of the gardens where Krishna danced with Radha. The blue sapphire the lapis lazuli, the amber of Hyperborea, the amaranth, the wild black thorn, the cinnabar, the gold which can be drunk, 
all came together, were transfigured, and began to dance before my eyes. Or rather, before my third eye, my vril, my urna. Because the bird of paradise had come to dance at my window for days and nights, to comfort me, making me partake of its pleasure, which has no beginning and no end, its ecstatic orgasm. And before it was swallowed up by the night, crossing the black sun, the bird of paradise looked at the sky far above the peaks of the Andes and exclaimed, The Father and I are one. Om, I replied. The Triad I know that it is very possible that I have been talking to myself all the time, from the beginning of this story, that the Master, my beloved and I, are only one person, that my ego is playing these tricks on me and has been putting my own thoughts, dreams, and mental creations into their mouths. In one word, my poetry. What can I do in this case? How can I get out of this ego, escape from its game, its dance of mirrors? How immense is the solitude of the trialogue? My trinity is made up of the father, the daughter, who is his wife, and their son, who I am. In this way, the three of us are spinning in a gigantic or a tiny spiral. And, surreptitiously, I have fallen in love with her, who is my mother and my sister, and I have made her my wife, so that the father becomes my son, and she becomes my eternal amor. And I give birth to a fiery lily, in the silence and solitude of the white peaks of my trialogue. And thus we come, all three, spinning and suffering, dancing and rejoicing, in light and shadow, moving towards a place which is perhaps colored green, and which is so far away that I can see nothing of it at all. All this seems to be happening in a non-existent space, among the lotuses. Saham. I am them. The Last Supper The end of another year arrived, at the beginning of the age of Aquarius. I decided to give a dinner in my tower, inviting all my phantoms. As is prescribed in such cases, I prepared the meal myself. It consisted of the five elements, cereal, earth, fish, water, meat, fire, wine, air, and her. The ether. The liquor was Soma, which continues above the ether and is indescribable. I filled the grail with this liquor and drank it to the dregs. To my round table I had invited my master, the wounded king, the wounded warrior, the master of the sphinx, the master who could converse with the animals and flowers, and her who presided over the table with me as mistress of the house. Some of the guests hadn't known each other while they were alive in the turnings of the wheel. They hadn't coincided with one another. And it is quite possible that they would have held opposing views, but only superficially. I introduced them to one another and told them that the indissoluble bond which joined them together was to be found in my heart, in which there had grown the certainty that they were all Hyperboreans. Raising my cup, I exclaimed, Let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. They were the words of the wounded king. Then I recited Blake. I give you the end of a golden string. Only wind it into a ball. It will lead you in at heaven's gate, built in the city's wall. Hear the voice of the bard, who present, past, and future sees whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees, calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. O earth, O earth, return, arise from out the dewy grass. Night is worn and the morn rises from the slumberous mass. Turn away no more, why wilt thou turn away? The starry floor, the watery shore, is given thee 
till the break of day. And so the dinner continued until midnight. Then I felt a dry shock, as if I had fallen from my soul into my skin, and I found myself sitting there alone, discovering that I had always been so, that there was no one round my table, that there never had been, that they had all left, and that midnight was my midday. The Leap Into the Void The man left the house very early, at daybreak, and walked slowly towards the highest of the hills. The dog followed a little way behind him, wagging its tail. When he reached the top of the hill, the man stopped, stretched out his arms, looked at the sky which was still dark, and in which the morning star shone triumphantly, and leapt over the precipice as if he wanted to fly. The dog rushed, howling down the rocky slope in search of the man's body, which it believed must be lying, crushed and broken, at the bottom. I ran out and managed to catch the dog. Stop, I shouted at it. I'll explain everything. Today you will be with me at her right hand. The morning star detached itself from the sky and began to descend towards us, coming to a stop close behind us, without touching the cinnamon trees or the grass of the Andean plateaus. And this time I asked the question, but he who entered the disk of light, which would carry him to meet the image of his eternal lover, was the man who had leapt into the void and had come back to life with square pupils. Nas. Thank you for listening to this wonderful work of art. It represents the end of the Kali Yuga, the return of the Golden Age. Read to you by Hermes. Messenger of Sophia. Keep up the great work.